good morning everyone it give me immense pleasure to welcome my guide teacher dr jayesh rahalkar along with chetan jayade sir as a guest speaker dr ajinkya dy patil sir chairman dy patil dental school dr rahul hegde director dy patil dental school dr anand shigli dean dy patil dental school dr sonali ma'am head of department dy patil dental college pimpri pune dr shital potnis professor siyagad college dr sachin durkar professor dy patil dental college pimpri and dr anand tripathi executive committee member indian orthodontic society and all the delegates over here it all started in 1963 the only speciality of dentistry started with study group in bombay which was formally established as a indian orthodontic society in 1965 the late dr h d marchand was the founder president and dr nishad parekh the founder secretary and treasurer since then we have been celebrating this orthodontist day owing to this celebration i bring you today's power pack session on biomechanics from basic to advanced i guarantee you all ka the, all this knowledge will help you a lot in your academic as well as clinics so i again welcome you all thank you thank you sir coming together is a beginning keeping together is progress working together is success edward l On this note here we have a honorable chief guest of this day Dr Jayesh Raharkar sir and Dr Chetan Zaide sir also we acknowledge the presence of a Dr Anand Shigli sir dean dy pds pune thank you for being here on this very beautiful day light fades away darkness light symbolizes knowledge and wisdom to solemnize this special invitation i would like to entreat our chief guest for the day Dr Jayesh Raharkar sir Dr Chetan Zaide sir Dr Anand Shigli sir Dr Sonali Deshmukh ma'am Dr Anand Tripathi sir Dr Sandeep Jethe sir and Dr Varsha Mehrani ma'am to come forward and illuminate the lamp lighting
Now I would like to call upon Dr. Anand Shigli, sir, Dean, DYPDS, Professor Head, he, Professor Head of Department of Orthodontics, Dr. Sandeep Jethe, sir, and Dr. Varsha Mirani, ma'am, Scientific Committee Chairman, to felicitate Dr. Jayesh Raharkar, sir, with flowers. Now, now I would like to call upon Dr. Chetan Zaide, sir, and request Dr. Anand Shigli, sir, to felicitate him. I would like to invite Dr. Sonali Deshmukh, ma'am, Head of Department of Orthodontics, D.Y. Patel Dental College and Hospital, Pimpri, on the stage. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to invite Dr. Anand Tripathi, sir, Executive Committee Member, Indian Orthodontic Society, on the stage. Thank you, sir. I would like to invite Dr. Sheetal Potnis, ma'am, Professor, Siagar Dental College, on the stage. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to invite Dr. Sachin Durkar, sir, Professor, Dr. D. Y. Patel Dental College and Hospital, Pimpri, on the stage. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Varsha Mirani, ma'am, Associate Professor, Department of Orthodontics, DYPDS, Scientific Committee Chairman, to introduce the first guest speaker for the session, Dr. Chetan Zaide, sir. It is my honor and privilege to introduce the first guest speaker of the day, Dr. Chetan Zaide, sir. He completed his BDS in the year 1998 from Karnataka University. He completed his MDS in 2001 from Rajiv Gandhi University. He is the first Indian to have cleared MORTH RCS from Edinburgh in the year 2004. He has a vast teaching experience of over 18 years. Some of his academic achievements include his master's dissertation won the national award for best thesis in 2001. He has also contributed to textbooks like Refined Bags for Modern Times and essentials of orthodontic biomechanics. His areas of biomechanics, biomaterial in bone adhesion, 
and finite element analysis. With so much to his name, I would now like to welcome Sir on the stage so that he can share his knowledge about biomechanics. Sir, please come. So you want to clap? Am I audible? Am I audible at the last? Yes? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Sorry to have kept you all waiting. I know there are two kinds of people who make people wait, isn't it? In India, at least. It's either the politicians or film stars. And I can assure you I'm none of them. But uh, due to a bus delay and bus breakdown, which I had no control or role to play in, I had to just wait for Pune to arrive and uh, the bus literally was delayed by about three hours. So I'm really sorry for having kept you all waiting. The organizers also have put in uh, so much of effort to have this program going. And all of you, all the students here, postgraduates as well as practitioners who have come from far and wide to listen to Dr. Jayesh and myself. Well, at the outset, I must say that I must compliment the college here and the Department of Orthodontics in particular for having put up such a wonderful show and that too within one month of the national conference being organized in Pune itself. The first question I'd ask Sandeep was, will you get enough audience for your first program to set in? But he was very particular. He said, yes, sir, we'll arrange whatever best we can, but we want to have it close to the orthodontic week and that's how this whole thing started. And uh, today we are here to talk about biomechanics. But before I get started with the topic per se for all of you, I have a small errand. 
and this comes from, from my father, uh, Professor V.P. Jayade, most of you would have heard him, and myself, being the co-authors of the book Essentials of Orthodontic Biomechanics. I feel it's my humble duty to present to the principal as well as the head of department, Dr. Sandeep and Dr. Anand Shigli, if they can come up onto the stage. I would like to hand over one copy for the department here at D.Y. Patil. I'm highly thankful for having called you and I hope So I hope to all the PGs here it would be really helpful for uh, biomechanics. So let's get started with our presentation. to just uh, dim the light a little. Okay. This is for forward, right? No. Okay. I can come back and do it here. You just try. If it works, well and good. Otherwise, then do it. Uh, so, we are going to start with the first lecture, which is going to be mainly on the relevance of uh, biomechanics, orthodontic biomechanics, and how you can actually apply it to clinical practice. And then subsequently Dr. Jayesh is going to go deeper into the origin of TADS, both the interdental as well as the bone screws. And then we'll have uh, in the afternoon one more talk by me, which will be on trying to understand how to differentiate which technique to use, that is whether TADS or fixed functional appliances for camouflaging class 2 malocclusion. So we're going to give you a lot of information and I hope all of you are up for it. Now, while we start, it's important that I know what kind of uh, crowd I'm addressing. So, any first-year PGs here? First-year postgraduate students? Some at least. And uh, how many are final-year students? Quite a few. Okay. So, then it's a good thing for me because I can ask you some questions. If 
finally has to be prepared. Yeah, let's start with the original concept. And uh, I always like to do this. Whenever a program is held on a particular day, you need to know what kind of day is celebrated. You have Father's Day, Mother's Day, Women's Day, unfortunately no Men's Day, but many other days, isn't it? And do you know what day it is today? I checked out and it happens to be Information Overload Day. And by that standard, both Jayesh and me have to load you with a lot of information which we are going to do. But at the end of it, the situation will not be as this person. Don't worry. Another thing I would like to emphasize here is please feel free to ask questions. Ultimately, we are here to give you as much information that we can. And therefore, it will be appropriate if you all ask questions at the end of the lecture for uh, each one of us. Now, this is a beautiful quote that I always start when I uh, have any talk on biomechanics. There is a saying, and I, I think some of you may be aware who said this, that give me a place to stand and I shall move the world, entire earth, if you give me just a lever. Do you know who said this? It was Archimedes. And going by the same, we can, in fact, as orthodontists, move the teeth in any direction we know that we are capable of. But how efficiently we are able to do is the question that we should have. People talk a lot about accelerated orthodontics. But do you know what is the best way by which you can do accelerated orthodontics? It is simply by using efficient biomechanics. And that is what we are going to, I'm going to start off in the first lecture. But unfortunately, what has happened is, if you look at the terminologies, if you look at some of the terminologies in orthodontic biomechanics, especially for first and second year students, it is something like this. All of you know this gentleman, right? Shashi Tharoor. And he talks in a language which is supposed to be English. But when you try to read his English, so-called English, can anybody read this out for me? It is a simple way of saying happy birthday. But look at the jargon. May your festive season be punctuated with revachism, whose magnolique magnoliquence can only be theotroplistically analyzed by the use of reminiscent language, etc., etc. So that is unfortunately what orthodontic biomechanics has become. It has become sort of Greek and Latin, all of you, including me, when we started studying biomechanics, it was only for that 20 mark essay question and maybe a couple of short notes and maybe a couple of viva questions. That's all we try to read up for. But that's not what it should be. In fact, if you look at what Burston has said, Burston has mentioned that orthodontics is the core of the entire orthodontic treatment itself, which means it's like the two sides of a coin. One side being the clinical sciences, the other side being the biomechanics. If you are good, if you understand biomechanics, obviously you'll be a good clinician and vice versa. Both cannot be separated from each other and that is why we emphasize as teachers the role of biomechanics. Now the standard textbooks all of you would be aware of, the best book that I can recommend here is the book, last book written by late Professor Burston and uh, co-authored by Choi. The second edition has also come out now. And the other book, which is by Dr. Ravinanda, again, one of uh, our own Indian uh, orthodontists who settled in the US. And we have uh, another book, which my father wrote in order to simplify it for all of us. And those are the sources from where you can get a lot of information. But let's look at what is it that orthodontists should know about biomechanics and why is it really relevant. The first one is to understand the basics of the forces, moments, etc., which all of you would have read in uh, several areas through articles or journal clubs and seminars, etc. The second is to understand the concepts of static equilibrium as well as solving the problems, etc. But the more important thing comes in when you talk about actually moving teeth using the orthodontic biomechanics. More often than not, especially the final years here would agree with me, that you make a wire adjustment in a given patient as per what your instructor has said and what you understand should be happening. And after a month when the patient comes back, 
and you see that not everything has happened exactly the way you planned, isn't it? How many times do you actually think, go back and think, what could have gone wrong biomechanically? What could I have done it differently to improve my situation? And uh, in, in for the next patient in whom a similar problem arises. If you start doing that from now on, especially the first and second years here, you will realize that biomechanics is nothing but a day-to-day -day activity, a part of our life as an orthodontist. It, it, it's not something that you learn as a mundane subject only for the theoretical purposes, right? So the other aspects that uh, Burson emphasized was in order to understand the principles of appliance design, because of which you should understand how the wire and brackets work, what is friction and the other variables, etc. Material sciences applied to wires and appliances in general. And this is very important. In today's world, where aligners are taking orthodontics by storm, there are many other new techniques or modalities which are coming in. For everything, you need to know how does the material, let's say an aligner material, how does it apply the force on which area of the tooth because of which you expect a particular tooth movement to occur? Or what is it that additionally you need to incorporate in the form of an attachment in order to bring about a desired tooth movement? Are you with me? Yes? So that is why we have to emphasize more and more about these conceptual understanding. So biomechanics, if you divide, it is the biological aspect and the mechanics part. And these, when you start understanding in detail, life becomes very easy as well as interesting. And the last is to actually, what you should do for every patient is a treatment plan derived from a biomechanical perspective also. Now, how do you normally derive a treatment plan for a given patient? Let's say a class two div one or a class one with crowding. What is it that you look at? The cephalometric picture, the space analysis, and the smile design, isn't it? Aesthetics. And then you say, I'm going to do this, extract these teeth and do uh, X, Y, Z. But suppose the patient also has a midline discrepancy, okay? And he has, let's say a deep bite, which needs intrusion. It is mandatory for all of you that you think additionally, what are the uh, additional biomechanical objectives that you should incorporate in your treatment plan for this given patient. For example, simple thing, for a midline shift and a case with premolar extraction, you do not extract on the side in which the midline is already shifted. Do you follow that? It is a sort of a biomechanical objective because then you are able to swing the midline first, then extract the other tooth and use that space for whatever else you wish to plan. Likewise, I'll be explaining about the one couple systems for incisor intrusion, etc. So we'll go into that a little in detail. Unfortunately, our entire orthodontic specialty was focused mainly on appliances or materials alone. And therefore, colleges or activities in departments like this will help all of you to assimilate more of this conceptual understanding of orthodontic biomechanics. Now let's go into the nitty gritty of biomechanics. For the final years, this might be a sort of repeat, but it is mandatory. Just as you enter an aircraft, and when you are boarding, just before boarding, what happens? The air hostess is going to announce all the safety instructions. In orthodontics, remembering biomechanics is like putting on the seat belt and also understanding the safety instructions. So I'll go into details of these one by one, and then we'll come back to the clinical applications of biomechanics. So under force and activation as deactivation force, there is something important that you need to understand. This is especially for first and second year postgraduates. The final years, please patiently hear this because it's going to be more of a recap for you. So what is the difference between the activation and the deactivation force? Force is a mechanical entity. You are applying it to move the teeth. Right? But the force which is used by you uh, through the wire is what we call as the activation force. Suppose there is a tooth which is in standing and you are applying a force to push the wire into the bracket. What are you doing here? You are applying a... I need some kind of reciprocation. As it is, the lights are dull. You've been waiting for more than an hour. You know what happens? You go into a meditative state, isn't it? And deep meditation accompanied with some sound suddenly 
it will be very difficult for me to understand what's happening. So what, what, what do you imply here? What kind of a force are you applying when you push the wire into the bracket? You are applying an activation force. Now this same activation force in the bracket will result through the entire month into the deactivation force being expressed. And this is important when you study equivalent force systems. We won't go into the details of that right now. But remember you should know the difference between activation and deactivation force. So let's see a small animation here which talks to you about the same. If, if it plays, sometimes there is some issue. Is the audio jack working? Anybody from the AV team here? Yeah, if it works, it will be good. Otherwise, we'll have to skip that part. Okay. Now we come to how orthodontists work. Whenever we apply the force which is away from the center of resistance, that is imagine this to be the tooth and we have a bracket which is stuck on the crown level. So what's going to happen there? The force is acting away from the center of resistance if we apply the force through a arch wire, isn't it? So how will the reaction be? The reaction will be part translation and part rotation. Now this how do you understand is by using the concept of moment of a force. So this rotational tendency is nothing but the moment. And if it is caused by a single force or a group of forces, you draw what is called as a resultant of forces and then you check the orientation of this force to the center of resistance, you will come to what is called as a moment of a force. Whereas what I described earlier as a couple was the moment generated would be a moment of a couple. They are distinguished by giving different notations. For example, here you use MF, that is small, the capital M and a subtitle of F. And the direction of the moment, movement of the tooth has to be understood by continuing the force towards the center of resistance no matter where it is applied. So this is something that you need to do uh, clinic, uh, theoretically whenever you sit and work out any biomechanical problems. My suggestion and recommendation to all the postgraduates here is the first article you should pick up and read 
for biomechanics is AGO 1984 April issue, the uh, mechanics of tooth movement by Smith and Burston. First start with that article and then you go to the books etc. Because all these concepts are clarified very beautifully in that first article and then you, you start off with others which are in seminars in orthodontics etc. So what is important for all of you to remember here is whenever the force is applied, let's say at the labial part or the lingual part of the tooth, the moment is not calculated from the bracket level, but you extend the line of force and draw a perpendicular bisector. So the force times the perpendicular distance here will tell you the moment of a force. Now this might sound very theoretical right now, but as you start working out problems on understanding one couple systems, etc., you'll understand that this is very, very important. Now let's go back to the previous example wherein I said, imagine this to be the tooth, there's a bracket and there's a force applied, the tooth is moving in an uncontrolled manner. What do you call this normally? Biologically, if you have to talk, uncontrolled tipping, isn't it? Now is this favorable, uncontrolled tipping? Most of the time, no. So how do you resist this uncontrolled tipping from occurring using some biomechanical uh, way? Anybody? Any finally? Anybody? Just take a chance. It has to be a two-way traffic. It can't be one way now. Yeah? Anybody? Just try to answer. In the meantime, if somebody can just have my laptop connected to a charger, that will be helpful. So many final years raise their hands, right? Now nobody wants to try? Just try. Anybody? Please stand up and answer loudly so that even if it's wrong, doesn't matter. Or they'll give you a mic also. Yeah. You can pass the mic. So to have a counter moment. This one? Should be. Should be. Yeah, should be. No, but I can't see the pointer. Just for going down. No. Take it. Take it. Yeah. So to develop a counter moment, so mm -hmm. that the moment uh, which is developed by the primary force is counteracted. Okay. So you have to develop something else in the form of a counter moment. That's right. An applause to her. Uh, can we have the lights dimmed a little bit, not totally dark? Is that possible? If possible, we'll we'll work that way because. Otherwise, I can't see the audience. Uh, neither can I see this pointer. I do not know what I'm pointing at. No. Light here will not help because this will not be seen. Something at the back. Yeah. I think this is better. I can see the audience a little bit. So this counter moment that she mentioned the counter moment can be using another moment of a force or it could be by using a couple, a force couple. And which is why we should know how do you apply a force couple. Anybody? How do you apply a force couple into a bracket? What is it that generates a, let's say a second order force couple? Some fine layer. Anybody? Fine layer PG. Yes? can leave the mic there itself so that we can have more interaction. Rec the rectangular wire in the slot will basically counter the uh, moment of uh, force that we are applying. Okay. So if you have a round wire, will it counteract or not? No. Okay. Uh, no, not really. Sit down, sit down. I mean, this is a common fallacy that we have and understanding that we think that only rec uh, the rectangular wires or close to full size wires are going to do the job, not really. The movement starts to occur right from the time when you are on NITA, even round NITA wires, provided that there is a deflection strong enough to induce a force at the two corners of the bracket. So it could start even with a light wire like a 016 NITA, which is why Bennett and McLaughlin say that you use a lace back and start it off even on a 016 or a 
one four wire. So what are you doing there? The lace back itself is generating a sort of a force. Your wire is generating a counter moment, which is low. It is not sufficient to bring about bodily movement. No doubt about it. But at least the counter moment starts off. So get that out of your mind that a counter moment can be produced only by a rectangular wire in a rectangular slot. Okay? It can be produced by several other means. I'm going to show you some of those. So how do you do that? The counter moment could be acting either mesiodistally, which is second order, and this happens usually by round or rectangular wires. Basically, it's the stiffness of the wire which will matter here, not the cross section of the wire. Remember it in a second order plane. And in the third order, you would necessarily need a rectangular wire here if you are to talk about the effect of torsion and the third order plane. So earlier in techniques like the Beck technique or the Tippett's technique, how did they generate this counter movement? They were still able to torque the teeth, isn't it? There they were using auxiliaries such as uprighting springs and torquing auxiliaries in order to bring about this movement. So we'll go a quick, little quickly because otherwise we'll end up doing the whole day of only biomechanics. Okay. So what, what is shown here is either you can use this analogy wherein the wire and the bracket have some kind of an angulation. So in pre-adjusted appliances, in contrast to the standard edgewise, what's happening? You have a built-in slot which is angulated. Therefore, even a plain wire like a 1-6 night egg gets deflected. And this deflection is what? An activation force. What is the deactivation force here? The wire trying to straighten itself because it's a super elastic wire. As it does that, it generates two equal and opposite forces which are the parts of a moment of a couple. And that is how you eventually generate the, uh, third, the moment of a couple, the counter moment of the couple. Now what is important is even an uprighting spring or a torquing auxiliary as is shown here can generate the same because ultimately remember what is needed for generating a moment of a couple? Two equal and opposite forces, that's it, which are non-collinear. How you generate that is left to you. We have made it simple by usage of straight wire or pre-adjusted appliances wherein everything is preset. So the wire you put in is going to try and get the root into a particular angulation, right? But you can do it using other methods also. Okay. So let's talk about walking or retraction of a canine. How many of you do separate canine retraction followed by incisor retraction? Fine layers, just raise a fan. So most starting with the president-elect who is raising his hand from this corner. Most of you would be doing both the techniques, isn't it? Wherein you try both canine retraction followed by incisor retraction or en masse retraction. You have to learn both the methods. So what happens when you do a separate canine retraction is that initially the force that you are applying to retract the canine, be it a lace back, be it an e-chain or some kind of elastic force, that is going to cause initial tipping. This tipping will be, there will be a binding of the wire because of the deflection which tends to generate a small counter moment. And as you increase this, the wire from being a round nitide to a round steel to a rectangular steel, what's going to change there? It is mainly the stiffness of the wire and therefore the force couple which is going to change and therefore you get more of a controlled or a translatory type of a tooth movement. Now likewise, the moment of a couple in the third, third order using two forces by torsion of the wire itself. So what is shown here, what is depicted here is that the rectangular wire has been twisted in such a way that it generates a force upward here, downward here. Together it will generate a counter moment of a couple which will negate, try to negate the moment which is generated by the force which is depicted here. Okay? So orthodontics is nothing but an interplay of this moment to the counter moment. Are you all with me? Just simple as that. You try to simplify it this way, then it, it becomes very meaningful and you can apply all this knowledge in a very practical way. Okay. Uh, we'll skip this because this is about standard edgewise and how it uh, came across. 
what is important there are two more concepts which you should know one is the moment to force ratio and the last one is the equilibrium if you understand these concepts then we are good to go to clinical relevance as such so what is the m by f ratio now this is a ratio which is generated by uh, using the counter moment in the numerator and the force that you apply to bring about a moment in the denominator so the ratio that you get by dividing the counter moment by the force is what is called as a uh, moment to force ratio and in this we are considering one or we are assuming something what are we assuming that the center of resistance is roughly 10 mm from the bracket slot as shown in that animation do you remember the first animation yes so based on that if you look at it then for uncontrolled tipping whenever you get uncontrolled tipping what should be the type of counter moment that is being generated is it going to be high or very low some answer please is it going it's going to be very low correct because if you have a higher counter moment what's going to happen you are going to negate the moment that is generated by the force itself and then you will get more of bodily moment isn't it simple as that again so a low counter moment which means a low m by f ratio will bring about uncontrolled tipping if you increase the counter moment a little more now how do you increase this counter moment that is the clinical application what you should understand how do you increase the counter moment you increase it by increasing the dimension of your wire so let's say you are using a o22 slot you started off with a 1725 steel for example you go to a 1925 you have the option of going to a 2125 also to have maximum effect or those who are using 18 slots you can use 1622 and the option of 1725 by doing so you are increasing the counter moment automatically so what happens is you get more of control tipping and if you go further and if you are exactly able to negate the moment that you generated by way of your force what happens here it's supposed to give you pure translation but mind you we are never going to get pure translation for a long time it's only for a short period again the tooth moves again the center of resistance and the entire m by f ratio changes and therefore what happens is you don't get the pure translation and finally if you want to get more of root control what do you do that you increase the the counter moment much higher than the moment that is generated by the force so that is why these numbers remember for a 10 mm the root uh, or the center of resistance being 10 mm away from the bracket you have these numbers as 10 is to 1 or 12 is to 1 8 is to 1 etc if you use the same logic in a smaller tooth in which the center of resistance is at 5 mm what will be the m by f ratio required for bodily movement 5 is to 1 it's not going to be 10 is to 1 there so please put it out of your head that only if you have a m by f ratio of 10 is to 1 you are going to get controlled or a bodily type of a movement it depends on which teeth you are talking about okay so this is another animation i don't know whether this is going to play you can try is somebody there with the laptop you can try if it plays otherwise we skip this <coughs> because this would explain how the force and the moment to force ratio would be brought about If a single force is applied to the bracket, the moment to force ratio is zero, and the center of rotation will be positioned approximately 10 millimeters above the bracket close to the CR. When a moment is also applied so that the moment to force ratio is equal to 5, the center of rotation will be displaced apically. and will be in the area of the apex about 18 mm above the bracket if a moment and a force with a ratio of 10 is added to the bracket a translation will occur and the center of rotation is at infinity if the moment to force ratio with respect to the bracket is 13 
the center of rotation will be close to the bracket and a root movement will take place. Whenever you look at the types of tooth movement, that is uncontrolled tipping or controlled tipping, etc., you have for these movements a point around which the tooth is rotating. So this is this is called as what? The center of rotation. And the center of rotation need not be within that tooth area. Remember that. And for that, again, you can go through the detailed article or the description in Smith & Burson's uh, uh, article AJO84. Okay. So we'll skip this also. We'll, what is important is, remember that these MBIF ratios are never universal. It is determined by the size of the tooth as well as the height of bracket placement. Now if you look at some of the modified techniques these days, are you all aware of Pitts 21 or even Damon? The way in which the Damon brackets are placed, are recommended to be placed or in Pitts 21. They're much higher from what Andrews had positioned or mentioned as the uh, the line of the center or clinical crown, the cent long axis of the uh, clinical crown or the FACC point, that will change. So the M by F ratio here will again be different if you are using the PITS 21 prescription. And likewise, if you look at the orientation of the root or the bone support, as was described earlier, the center of resistance is going to shift more apically or more occlusally based on which your MBIF ratio will again have to be altered. So keep in mind that there are a lot of variations that will be seen and therefore different teeth in the same individual or the same teeth in different individuals will uh, respond very differently to the same mechanics that you apply. So this is just a recap again. The center of rotation for uncontrolled tipping will be closer to the apex. As you go completely to the uh, uh, or rather control tipping, you are going to see it at the uh, apical junction or the apex itself. And for translation, it is considered to be at infinity. Why is that? Because there is no rotation at all. The entire tooth is moving uniformly. So there is no center of rotation. And therefore you say it is at center of, uh, is it, it's at infinity. And the last one is when you are doing root movement. So here the center of rotation moves down and comes closer to the uh, crown and it would be either at the incisal edge or the cuspal tip. That is how you would remember. Now the last concept which is important clinically is to understand what is the state of equilibrium. Now whenever you put a wire into the patient's mouth, into the brackets and leave the patient, do you see tooth movi moving in the within, within a, uh, let's say a couple of days? Not necessarily, they may move just a bit as much as the periodontium allows. But will the entire tooth movement occur in just about a week? No. Because there's a lot of biologic changes that need to happen for the entire tooth to move. And till such point we say that the entire system is in equilibrium. Now just to give you a very simple example. Now I'm standing on this floor, right? What is pushing me down is the gravity and my mass. What is pushing me up or holding me in place here? It's the resistance offered by the floor itself. Now imagine the same on one of the sandy beaches of Goa. What happens as you walk in a muddy area or a, a sand area, what happens? You sink a little because that is the amount of resistance that the sand can offer. It is not as good as a wood or a, a let's say, cement. And likewise, if you go into uh, quicksand, you're going to sink completely down. But there will be a state of equilibrium depending on how much is your weight, mass and the gravity as well as how much resistance is being offered. In orthodontics, the same applies. Whenever you put a wire and a bracket into the patient's mouth, everything will be in a state of equilibrium. The summation of all the reciprocal forces that are generated by the system will be necessarily zero, equal to zero. The sum of all moments in all the three directions or planes of space will also be zero. Remember that. And that is how the entire system starts working from that point onwards. Now your question to me should be, if everything is in equilibrium, why should teeth move? Isn't it? Teeth move because there is a force that is pushing one area up. There will be a recipro reciprocal or a reactionary force 
which will be pushing some other part down. That is what brings about the equilibrium. But it doesn't stop you from getting the tooth movement actually seen or getting affected. Do you follow me? At least somewhat, right? Once you go back, and the other set of articles I would re really recommend all of you to read is Common Sense Mechanics by Thomas Mulligan. 1979 JCO, the entire series which came up, uh, 14 articles, is something that all of you should at least go through the first four or five because that gives you much more uh, of the clinical sense of what we are talking. Right, let's go ahead. So this is about the equilibrium. So whenever you apply a set of vertical forces to intrude the anteriors, what's going to happen to create equilibrium? There'll be a set of extrusive forces somewhere else. And that is what we have to be wary about. Most of the time, these will be harmful or these will not bring about the tooth movement in the, uh, in the direction that you wanted. And that is where your acumen as, a, as an orthodontist, as a clinician becomes very, very important. So if I have to put biomechanics in a nutshell, all this what we studied, just remember these five or six points that I'm going to put up here. The first point is that a tooth or a group of teeth embedded in bone will respond to forces or moments based on the line of force. Okay? The line of force, even if it is multiple forces, it will be the final resultant of forces. That is all that really matters. The second point is that since a force may not pass through the center of resistance most of the time, the moments can be happened as occurring around a center of rotation because you do not get pure translation all the time uh, because of our inability to pass the force from that point. Variation in, a or variation in combination of forces as well as moments helps us to bring about all the three biomechanical moments that we described. So just a force, you are going to get total uncontrolled type of movement, whereas as you increase the counter moment, you tend to get better control on the movement and then you can even achieve root movement using a higher m by f ratio. That is what you should remember. So the depending on the interplay, you use what is called as a m by f ratio and after the arch wire is placed in the mouth, the rules of equilibrium are going to set in. These may be harmful or these may be useful. So you have to judge which is useful, which is not useful and work accordingly. For example, in a utility arch, given in a patient, let's say, who is a high angle uh, case versus a utility arch in a low angle case, where is the re uh, reciprocal force going to be helpful? In which among the two? In the low angle, exactly, because you know that you need to open up the mandibular plane angle by extruding. So there you need not do anything to counter that. But in a high angle patient, if you use a similar type of a mechanism, without supporting with, let's say, a TPA or a TAD, then you are going to end up with different problems. So which is what you need to remember. So biomechanically, I mentioned this, that there are only three types of tooth movements. Remember that. And one should understand the ultimate intricacies of all this. So this is where we are. I'll, I'll just skip a few slides. Can we go? Uh, a little ahead, maybe five, six, so that we go to the biomechanics of TADS and then I'll end my presentation. Little ahead. Uh, yeah, maybe you can start from here. Yes. Okay. Now, one more concept which you should remember is one couple and two couple systems as well as what is called as the force-driven and shape-driven type of mechanics. These are terms introduced by Burston. You should be able to understand them properly. Uh, I'm going to just touch upon them, but remember, most of the treatments that we do using preformed wires are going to be what? They're going to be shape-driven. You have a preformed shape. Now, if you go to any of the Damon workshops, what do they tell you? Use the Damon arch form, teeth will move beautifully because it is all shape-driven and also the friction has been reduced drastically. So the teeth move faster and in a more, uh, m in a manner which is going to be helpful for orthodontists most of the time. But remember, you can't overdo it. 
you can't challenge or you can't violate the boundaries of bone that's something that you should remember as an orthodontist okay versus this there is something called as force driven in which you try to generate the forces and moments in such a way that you are in total control for example what is called as a one couple system in which you use the mechanics for intrusion or even let's say molar derotation or distalization in such a way that you are in total control of where is the force going to act how much is it in fact if you work out a simple problem of a one couple system i can help you understand if you put a 20 mm for 20 mg force on the incisor at the bracket level how much is going to be uh, and for a particular type of intrusion arch how much will be the reciprocal extrusive force how much of tooth movement to expect in a healthy individual etc etc it's definitely possible to do it manually now you have softwares which can do it and predict uh, approximately what kind of tooth movement will be brought about so that is an example of what we call as force driven systems wherein you are in total control of the forces that you are applying onto the given tooth so force systems themselves are or force driven systems are also called as uh, or can be divided into statically determinate or statically indeterminate Now when you have statically determinate you can actually measure manually what kind of forces are applied indeterminate will be something in which you cannot actually calculate easily and they are far too complex and therefore you call them as statically indeterminate type of systems so most of the two couple systems would fall under that or continuous arch mechanics would fall under that whereas whenever you use a one couple system i'll show you an example that will be helpful <coughs> will be something in which you can do a statically determinate type of a uh, calculation so let's see one of the example this is something that i borrow from dr jayesh <coughs> to show this example of a bracket and a wire now what is shown here there is a back bracket uni point contact a two point contact tube and you have the arch wire with an anchor bend right an intrusive kind of a bend now this same thing can be used in pre adjusted also provided you tie the wire outside the bracket slot and don't engage it into the slot per se so what's going to happen if you pull the wire down you have activated you have applied a activation force what happens next is how the wire would deactivate so for deactivation what you should remember is there is a two point contact here that is happening at the two ends there is a intrusive force here and extrusive force here equal and opposite non collinear what does that generate generates a moment of a couple now this couple moment of a couple doesn't have any kind of a balancing couple there okay so if you follow the rules of equilibrium what should you have the net sum of all the forces and moment should be equal to zero but it's not happening here so what happens is automatically there will be a reciprocal force which will be seen in the form of an intrusive component here an extrusive component here and if you measure the force times the distance it will be exactly equal and opposite to this so you are going to have if this was a clockwise couple you are going to have an anti clockwise couple but which will be manifested as intrusion and extrusion there and therefore you get the intrusive effect of an anchor bend as such or a utility arch it is the position at which this anchor bend or a tip back bend was placed which is more crucial than what kind of or how much of a force is being seen in the incisor area so just remember that so that is an example of a one couple system whereas if you look at two couple systems you have the utility arch which was popularized by rickets and typically if you look at the way in which the utility arch is placed you have the tip back bend there you also have added labial root torque here and when you apply the two couples there there will be two couples isn't it one on the molar and the other at the in, which generates the equilibrium there and you have the other couple which is because of the twist of the arch wire which will generate the second couple which has to be again balanced out and therefore you get the necessary intrusion and extrusion 
with labial root torque you can control the amount of uh, root position or also so this is something that you should remember and burston and later on dr ravinanda popularized this term called as differential moments so you can have a continuous arch mechanics going on to align teeth whereas you can also have an auxiliary or a cantilever wire in the form of a let's say the intrusion arch that he uses the connecticut intrusion arch so there you are applying what is called as a differential moment because you are having a moment that is generated only at one part of the uh, tooth segment that is the molar and this will cause a sort of a tip back which will also hold on to the anchorage and what will effectively happen is more of intrusion while the alignment is also happening so this is called as a differential type of a moment being applied i'm sorry i'm rushing through a little because there's so many concepts and so little time to cover all this okay and the last part that you should remember is whenever you give bends they can have a lot of consequential effects for example if i were to give a step bend like this are you all aware of v bend and step bend yes all of you at least the second and third years yes okay so a step bend is nothing but a combination of two v bends which are equal in a way that the orientation from one bracket to the other bracket the wire bracket geometry or the wire bracket angulation remains the same can you see that it's exactly parallel between the two brackets and that's why this is called as a step bend if you make one or sometimes the malocclusion is such that one tooth is below one tooth is high so when you put a wire like a 016 knight i automatically you generate a step bend but what is impressive and also detrimental sometimes to orthodontists is a step bend can generate two equal and op, uh, equal moments in the same direction which will cause a lot of vertical movements also vertical side effects also therefore don't be in a hurry to put brackets on all the teeth and engage all the teeth uh, using a wire like a nite in the first attempt try to see if there is some kind of a complex geometry that is being formed if so then take it one step at a time in fact nanda advocates this he says first always do first order correction then go to thicker wires do second order and then finally go to third order corrections what do we normally do especially students you have a target isn't it five debonded cases for the exam what do you have to do every wire zor laga ke aisa ha huh? try to pull try to retract use as much of force as each chain if not one sometimes two isn't it try to close the gaps but that's not going to work because ultimately you have to play with forces and the moments if you apply too much of force the bone is not going to respond you are going to get more of undermining resorption so remember those things and then work just to end up with the complexity that you can have you know if you give a bend like this earlier in tweed finishing we used to be taught to make the wire bends like this but biomechanically if you look at this is the kind of final moments and forces that are being generated by just a v bend here and a step bend at two parts that is step bend here and here and here and here so what's going to happen is there are going to be too many moments so many forces ultimately you won't know what what is happening and after a month when the patient comes back and you are two months away from the exam you are like this patient cannot be shown in the exam shouldn't happen <clears throat> so play with these uh, bends in a very careful manner don't try to overdo them otherwise you'll end up in a lot of uh, problematic situations so I'll, we can go to the last conclusion part if anybody can just forward the slides there i'll i'll only do it i think and uh, <clears throat> many times we also use crossover mechanics wherein we can use the beg mechanics in pre adjusted or you can use pre adjusted mechanics in uh, the uh, tip edge or any other appliances also and uh, we also need to understand how the uh, forces and center of resistance is going to happen when we look at the tads which which will be describing later on in the second lecture i'm not going to go into this we'll just skip this because in my second talk this will be explained in detail again uh, we want dr jayesh also to lecture so somebody if you can just go ahead yeah and uh, 
these couple of points just follow them for being good clinicians the first one is that make sure that you are looking at all the three dimensions whenever you are predicting a type of particular type of tooth movement second is try to use those four systems which are more of one couple if you are looking at difficult tooth movements the tooth movement should be consistent with your end result that is what is consistent four systems and try to simplify the stages of treatment as well as the types of tooth movement do not try to bring about everything x y z direction movements in one go that's going to make life very very complicated and therefore many situations i used to tell my students do not go for continuous arch mechanics right from day one there are selected situations where continuous arches will work very well but there are also some instances in which the uh, segmental mechanics or sectional mechanics or innovative mechanics can help you better and one couple systems can work much better in certain situations so just keep that in mind and in the end ultimately be a smart clinician plan mechanical variation before bonding any brackets which means observe your patient's scars the day of bonding before the patient comes in just see what modifications you may have to do in your bracket positioning itself now there's a very interesting article in the uh, journal of orthodontics 2014 i suppose it's an article written by thicket and uh, they talk about the variations for bracket positioning for different types of malocclusions so if you're doing a class 3 camouflage or a class 2 camouflage or you're doing a second molar extraction uh, a second premolar extraction how do you modify your bracket position just go through that because you'll know what are the side effects and with small adjustments in your brackets you can start being a better clinician as such and my advice a simple advice to all of you is make a sort of a checklist as to what you expect in the next appointment in fact in our clinic in the case sheet what happens is the day the patient comes in we all of us write what we have done isn't it all of us do that how many of you write what is expected in the next appointment do you all do that some of you do yeah of course not the front benches the back ones it is very important and crucial that you should visualize what you are going to expect in the next appointment and i'll tell you a reason why why me and dr jayesh are talking about this is because we have assistants or trained people who can actually see if that has happened and they remove the wire and keep it when we go and start working over there something on the lines of what the american orthodontists do but they have so many trained auxiliaries for themselves that in a in a clinic do you know what a good orthodontic setup would look like in the us a 20 chair setup or a 14 chair setup with 16 to 18 trained orthodontic auxiliaries one or two orthodontists and they see about 100 patients in a day <clears throat> the day begins at 7 the day ends at 2:30 or 3 what it be a nice uh, thing to do and how much time does the orthodontist actually spend 2 to 3 minutes on some patients not all the patients he doesn't he or she doesn't see all the patients because that's how effective the next checklist would be for what is expected has it happened if it has not happened then the orthodontist is called otherwise it's just a quick change of arch wires and that's how the treatment progresses and uh, knowing biomechanics and if you are a snow slider or a skier this will not happen you if you understand biomechanics well your head will be on the above the ice and not beneath so this is my humble submission to all of you understand biomechanics in a way that will make you good clinicians and not vice versa don't think <clears throat> because i'm a good wire bender i can do everything that will not happen okay on <clears throat> and on that note thank you very much and if there are any questions we can take it up maybe in the break yeah <clears throat> thank you sir for enlightening us with your lecture since understanding the biomechanics is essential to determine the working of an appliance system and planning a force system to bring about necessary tooth movement 
and more importantly avoid the undesirable changes associated with it i am sure our delegates have learned the basics thoroughly and helped them in their clinics thank you sir now i would like to invite dr shailesh dongre sir associate professor department of orthodontics dy pds pune to introduce our guest speaker for the session dr jayesh raharkar sir thank you dr harshal it feels immense pleasure for me to welcome our next guest speaker of the day dr jayesh rahalkar sir dr jayesh rahalkar sir completed his bds in 1992 by standing first class first and mds in 1996 both from government dental college and hospital mumbai he is recip uh, recip recipient of the prestigious best outgoing student trophy for his academic excellence he was awarded by the diplomat of indian board of orthodontics in 2003 he completed m orth in 2004 which is awarded by the royal college of surgeon edinburgh england he was also awarded by the fellowship of dental surgeon of royal college of surgeon edinburgh uk in 2004 he was a director of indian board of orthodontics from 2014 to 2019 and past chairman of indian board of orthodontics from 2018 to 2019 he has many national and international paper publications and presentations at various conferences seminar and workshop to his credit he had been course faculty at various hands on courses he is also working as a re uh, reviewer for various national and international journals related to orthodontics and dentistry He has 25 years of teaching experience in the field of dentistry. He was former professor and head department of orthodontics at Deva Patil Dental College and Hospital Pimpri Pune. He is currently president elect of Indian Board of Indian Board of Orthodontics. Sir, now kindly take over the dais. hello hello yeah yeah am i am i audible till the last row
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. D. Y. Patil Dental School and uh, the management headed by Dr. Rahul Hegde, my dear friend, Dr. Shigli sir, uh, my very favorite colleague, Dr. Sandeep Jethe, my uh, very favorite uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Varsha, Dr. Shailesh, Dr. Arun, Dr. Suyog, and Dr. Jayashri and all the uh, staff members and the postgraduate students of this institute for hosting this wonderful event. And uh, it really gives me a pleasure to see uh, the young brigade of our Pune Orthodontic Study Group uh, now slowly taking the lead. And that is how it should be. And it's a pleasure always to have presentations with uh, my dear friend, Dr. Chetan. So it gives us a good tandem or synergistic appliance effect. So I'm going to talk about the TADS. I'm, this particular lecture I'm going to talk as an overview where I'm going to talk about the concept, procedures, <coughs> sorry, a little bit of biomechanics and uh, uh, some interradicular uh, screw cases. Uh, what happens whenever there is a shift of paradigm happens? Uh, we know that there is continuous shift which happens. See, for example, this particular program is also a continuing education program. So if we have to be an efficient clinician uh, and a professional who is updated, we need to keep on learning. We need to unlearn few things which are not in practice or which are not evidence supported and relearn those things which are good. So similarly, there are a lot of paradigms which come and go. Uh, so the current paradigm, uh, let's say about tides or for example, for anything, what happens whenever there is any innovative new concept which comes, it cannot avoid a evolution. You know, initially that particular idea is called as a useless idea and later on it becomes a widespread acceptance. Initially, it is rejected by majority and who claim that it can be, it can't be done or it's troublesome, it's not worth the effort. Then it is accepted by few while others say it's not yet there. And then uh, most people start using it and then they start questioning others, why are they not using it? And finally, that technique becomes a standard of care. And... Uh, I have heard about this particular paradigm shifts when I was a student about standard age wise, then back, then pre-adjusted like that. So back to pre-adjusted change of paradigm, I was a student to practitioner thing. But a paradigm of temporary anchorage devices coming and becoming the mainstay of orthodontics, I have witnessed it as a practitioner practicing for last 27 years. So. Uh, coming to the temporary anchorage devices, let's understand what does this particular thing means. Temporary anchorage device, it is defined technically as a device that is temporarily fixed to bone for the purpose of enhancing orthodontic anchorage, either by supporting the teeth of the reactive unit or by obviating the need for a reactive unit altogether and which is subsequently removed after the use. And the terminologies are continuously changing. Uh, you know that the same thing is called Bhagavan Khuda Atma Ishwar. So similarly, they are called as mini implants, mini screws, micro screws. Then the term started getting modified. Now we have a specifications. They used to be in, called as temporary anchorage devices, that is TADS. In some uh, countries, it was used to be called as bone anchorage devices, BAD and then skeletal anchorage devices. So sad, so the travel is from tad to bad to sad. Now, the uh, based on their sizes, their concept is finalized that which will be called as mini screws, which will be called as micro screws and skeletal temporary anchorage devices is the term which is accepted world over. So it's S tad, skeletal anchorage, temporary anchorage devices. And what is the benefit of this particular TAD? The procedure for which, th how the TADs are applied, they require minimum surgery. 
and there is no issue of patient compliance. I uh, did a lot of big appliances when I was a postgraduate student and all of you know that the patients have to wear the intermaxillary or intramaxillary elastics, class 1, class 2 elastics and the cooperation of the patient had to be of very high caliber. Then only the results used to happen. Then came the power chains and other things. But patient compliance, like for example, see you have to understand how this particular reinforcement or anchorage conservation started. We all know that headgears are basically used for two purposes, orthopedic and orthodontic. In orthopedic for growth control and in orthodontic basically for reinforcing the anchorage. You know, we know that the standard edge wise required a lot of anchorage because the force vectors were differently planned and because of which the anchorage preparation other things used to be there. And the patients were expected to wear the uh, headgear for anchorage reinforcement and if you uh, have read through the literature there is something called as a J-hook headgears where the anterior retraction used to be done with headgears. And it required a lot of patient cooperation. You know, uh, all of you know who gave the concept of headgear, Dr. Cloen. Right. And after say 15 years, Dr. Cloen was asked, uh, do you still use the headgear? So he uh, very funnily answered, yes, I do, but my patients don't. So that is how the compliance uh, requirement is there. And in the temporary anchorage devices, in TADS, compliance is not at all a major factor. And we know that it controls the anchors very efficiently and it is on three directional control, not only in one. It is anteroposterior, sagittal, that is sagittal, transverse and vertical. Then there had been claims when TAD came that they will reduce the need of extraction. Somehow uh, having uh, extractions done in orthodontic treatment is taken with a bad taste. I don't know why. But the we know that the pendulum of uh, treatment modality changes from extraction to non-extraction, non-extraction to extraction and again non-extraction. So it is swinging. So anything which gives a little bit of hint that this may prevent extraction, the orthodontist jump into that wagon. Okay. So it was when TAD came, they initially proclaimed that it will reduce need for extraction the way the uh, frictionless uh, appliances are marketed nowadays. But one thing I will definitely tell you that the borderline surgical cases can now be treated with uh, only orthodontic. So what we call nowadays as the orthognathic like orthodontics is possible because of the temporary anchorage devices and they can resist the forces up to 300 to 450 grams and now the functional appliances, the fixed functional appliances are also tried on the temporary anchorage devices and probably in couple of years we will have in the market the attachments for fixed functional appliances specifically for TADS so that you probably may not require um, the full bracketed fixed appliances. The patient may just have uh, one implant in the upper uh, each side. I mean two implants in the maxilla, two implants in the mandible and the fixed functional appliance will sit on that. So visibility and everything will be taken care of. And the benefit is if there is an immediate loading of the implant was possible because endosseous implant or the uh, prosthetic implants, osseo integrated implants were used in uh, as anchor supports in orthodontics since long. But they require time for osseo integration. So immediate loading of those prosthetic implant for orthodontic purpose was not possible. And that is the benefit of these temporary anchorage devices. The TADs can be immediately loaded and uh, uh, it comes with a pinch of salt that it shortens the treatment time. We all know about this particular envelope of discrepancy. And to that now we can actually add another circle where uh, the treatments which are possible with the help of TAD can be added. And uh, uh, this is what I had put it up uh, when the latest edition of profit uh, uh, was not there and I mentioned that this is probably we require and in the next uh, editions we really started having one more uh, envelope which can be controlled with the temporary anchorage devices. So what are these implants? Implant is any material which is retained more than uh, one month in the body according to the CDM, the MDD norms and uh, way back in 1945 uh, Gainsforth and Higley have suggested the use of these metallic screws as anchors and Linko, Sherman, uh, Crickmore have used this. So I will just share a, a literature with you. 
Crickmore and Eklund in a article given in uh, JCO April 1983 they suggested use of metal screw for intrusion of maxillary incisor then Sugawara and Omimori in 1997 showed the use of the mini plates which were the surgical plates which were uh, used for anchorage then Kanomi in 90s used the mini screw then the uh, Asian, you know, there are some things uh, in the field of orthodontics came from Europe, the functional appliances, the uh, American uh, continent came the fixed appliances and I think the mini screw is the concept which is now come from the Asian uh, people. So Park, Bay and Kyung, the Korean and the Japanese people, the Sendai people as well as the uh, Yonsai and Kyungpuk University, they uh, are the people who very aggressively uh, you know, marketed and used the implant. So, uh, I had gone for a mini residency program at uh, Yonsai and uh, the amount of implants and the timing was such that in our group we jokingly said that probably at the time of consultation before taking the impression they might be putting the implant and then taking the impression because we saw implants being put up in cases where we might feel it's not really required, it's an overkill. But what happens that whenever there is any new thing comes, there is a sudden surge of its use, there is a peak, then there is a decline and then there is a plateau. So the plateau of TADS has now come. So in my practice also when I started using TADS, the amount of uh, TAD used in and the number of cases were very high. But then later on I realized in this particular case, as Dr. Chetan rightly mentioned, if I would have used a proper concept of biomechanics, I wouldn't have required any TAD in this particular case. I would have uh, properly done without the TAD. So my use came down. Now it is a plateau. So we have a designated protocol that these are the cases which will require TADs. These are the, I mean the interradicular TADs. These are the cases which will require palatal TADs. These are the cases which will require bone screws. So that, you know, sorting and a proper structure comes after you start using it. So. See, this particular uh, figure is from Dr. Creekmore's article way back in 1983. 1983 was the time when I was in 8th standard and I myself was undergoing an orthodontic treatment and that is where these people have used the TAD. You know, you can see it was a regular screw and which is put in the anterior nasal spine area and the maxillary intrusion was done. So this was a patient who they said was gummy and these are the photographs you can see here. This is how the uh, intrusion pressure is given and the amount of intrusion what they have shown uh, is this much and this is the uh, intraoral photo, uh, radiograph what they had taken so uh, when we are doing these temporary anchorage devices we must have some clinical consideration we must understand what are the safe zones so we'll be talking about what are the safe zone uh, clinical decisions on what should be the implant type what should be the length and thickness how we are going to do the surgical procedure, what are the loading protocols, what are the risks and complications and how we are going to manage them and then we'll be looking at the clinical uh, case reports. Some will be common uh, cases which I'll talk in my first lecture and in the second lecture I'll be talking about management of little complex cases with the bone screws. So coming to the safe zones, various sites of implants in maxilla we all know, uh, if you're talking about the uh, extra radicular screws we know we can put it in the infrazygomatic crest area okay then maxillary tuberosity area the area is very good but the bone pattern is of d4 so it is not conducive for retention of the tad uh, then the intra radicular area or rather inter radicular area i would put it as uh, buccal even as well as the palatal or the lingual side and in heart palate in mandible uh, the most uh, thick, I mean D1 type of area is in the retromolar region, then in the uh, intraradicular uh, region and the mandibular symphysis and other areas are where you can actually put in is where there is edentulous areas. And on the uh, buccal side, so these are the uh, photographs from uh, article given about the safe zone, AJODO, Dr. Sarandeep Puja. He has an excellent article. It's one of the first articles where they have evaluated what should be the uh, safe zones for the maxillary and the mandibular dentition. And very well we can see here, what they have shown is uh, there is a very safe zone between canine and the first premolar uh, and between first premolar and uh, um, 
second premolar but you know uh, it's like this okay uh, uh, there is a city called uh, hubli where there is no traffic it's of no use to me i'm staying in pune so i mean even if there is a good bone between 3 and 4 it doesn't make much of use to me because majority of our cases where we are going to require tad is where 4 is going to get extracted and i'm going to use the space so what matters to me is what is the safe zone in the posterior region so whether between 6 or 7 or between 5 and 6 so considering whatever is the availability so taking a customized iopa and if possible a sectional cbct you can evaluate how much bone we have how are the curvatures and other things and on the this is on the buccal side of the maxilla this is on the palatal side of the uh, maxilla they have mentioned that uh, between 5 and 6 and 6 and 7 you have got good uh, bone because sometimes if the implant cannot be placed on the buccal side you may have to think of taking the support from the palatal side and then bond a hook with a bonding mesh pad to the canine palatal surface and use that for retraction okay and if we see the 3d view this is the maxilla this is the buccal view so this particular is the premolar root so between the premolar root and the mesobuccal root of the first uh, molar or between the distobuccal root and the mesobuccal root of the second uh, molar so this is between 6 uh, and 7 and this is between 5 and 6 a little bit of extra cancel is bone you are going to get it here but what matters for our retention of the tad is the amount of cortex what we have so this is regarding the maxilla now regarding the uh, mandible again luckily we have a good zone between 6 and 7 now the trick is that we have two things to consider okay we have a good bone it's a hard tissue between 6 uh, and 7 but clinically we have to see how much apically can we go what is the amount of soft tissue movable mucosa and the attached mucosa so where is our mucogingival junction because implants which are in the movable mucosa have a higher chances of periimplantitis and failure that has been documented so we have to try and find area where we are as apical as possible with maximum uh, bone available and along with that where the soft tissue irritations are not there and because of which the chances of implant failure will not be there so uh, this is uh, where you can actually see that even though uh, the bone shows there there is a little bit of recession and this particular areas and you have to understand the curvatures because just with two dimensional evaluation it becomes difficult so when you look at it from this point of view see this is the buccal side this is between 5 and 6 see the amount of bone available here and lingual i mean placing ling uh, mand i mean implant stats on the lingual aspect of mandible is quite difficult you require a hand piece for that and i have tried in one case where i have to actually do an intrusion of a tooth because of pre prosthetic region and i could place the implant but the patient's uh, i mean uh, the ulceration on the lingual mucosa was very high so the patient cooperation is very problematic even if you can do that and you cannot do it with a direct driver you will always require a hand piece adapter and then the adaptation needs to be and then the insertion should be done so this uh, uh, figure you can remember that bone density is categorized as d1 d2 d3 and d4 and the d1 is where there is a dense cortical density and they have mentioned how does it feel for the tactile sensation so for tactile sensation they have said that d1 is like an oak wood d2 is something like a white pine or a spruce d3 is balsa wood d4 is as if you are putting an implant in styrofoam and if you see the areas where sometime we require to go can be between d3 and d4 so you when you are doing um, the uh, insertion of the implant your tactile sensation can make out and you get an intuition whether your implant is going to stay or it's going to fail so what are the most common sites which i use is between 5 uh, and 6 and 6 and 7 in maxilla and mandible between upper maxillary incisors or between lateral and canine in for anterior intrusion what i uh, do is that if it's an extraction case and i have to do only sagittal movement that is only the antero posterior movement only the retraction we go for only two posterior implants between 5 and 6 if it has to be done along with intrusion and if it's an extraction case 
we try to put it between two central incisors because uh, my experience is that it gives a good control on the torque also. Okay, so if you are retracting and sometimes you feel that your torque is lost and the incisors are more upright, you need to torque them. This particular anterior implant helps them. This is in extraction cases. In non-extraction cases, what uh, there are studies which are done. Uh, one of the study was done by one of my uh, associate orthodontist only and she found that if you put two implants in the anterior region in non-extraction cases between lateral and canine, then the amount of intrusion retraction is very good. So if you have a non-extraction case where you need to only intrude for correction of the gummy smile, then in that case, uh, this particular uh, putting four implants, that is between five and six either side and between two and three either side works well. Uh, palatally, both mid palatine and intraradicular are good, but there is a safe zone of T, what you should uh, look for and you have to be very careful about the palatine artery because otherwise there is bleeding which can happen. Maxillary tuberosity area is uh, something uh, which is quite available but the amount of, I mean the type of bone is really not good and uh, recently what is my observation is that, uh, I mean uh, if you see in June 2022 there is an article uh, by uh, uh, Chris Chang and he has mentioned about the amount of failure of IZCs and what he has found is that between 20 to 29 years of age, the bone level is very nice. I mean, the bone pattern is very nice. There are less chances of uh, maxillary uh, sinus uh, penetration uh, as well as less implant failures. But below 20 and above 30, there are high chances of failures even in IZC because of the pneumatization above 30 and below uh, 20 it is basically because of the type of less cortication. So we have to keep all these things in mind. And mandibular retromolar area is a very good area, but again, a direct access is not possible. These are the areas where you may have to use a handpiece adapter. Now coming to the surgical procedure. Now before I go for surgical procedure, uh, please raise hands where uh, all of you who have put uh, the TAD in your clinical work. Please raise your hand. Okay, uh, raise your hand if you have observed it as an assistant. So probably these are the uh, second year students, these are the second year students. And those who raised the hand, they were third year students. Okay, so when you're finalizing the uh, implant site, use either OPG, IOPA, CT scans or CBCT. A sectional CBCT will be always good. But what is most important is the physical palpation of the root. That is the intra-socket movement which happens and uh, that leads to vibration and that has led to the failure of the implant. Then check that proper instrumentation is there and your sterilization protocols are good. Sometimes the nature is uh, you know, kind enough to get away with our routine orthodontic procedures because they are not invasive. But remember implants are invasive procedures so uh, a proper autoclave with a proper surgical scrub is necessary. And that's the only answer you have to remember. Uh, autoclave your instruments properly, put them in the drum or seal them in the pouch. And when you're preparing for the procedure, see to it that you do the proper hand wash. And luckily, you know, uh, there are some good things come out of uh, bad times. So after COVID, I think all of us are quite well trained about the hand wash methods. So uh, utilize the same and that is actually how we should have been doing it since ages. But somehow probably COVID has reinforced the importance of hand wash. So properly uh, do the hand wash in your clinic. See to it that you have at least a foot tap or an elbow uh, handle so that uh, when you're doing a surgical procedure, you don't have to touch the tap. Uh, then this is the proper attire and the hand wash you should do. Whatever your oral surgeon friends are preparing the trolley for disimpaction procedure, prepare exactly the same way. Okay, if you po follow their procedures exactly the same way, like you know how you put the drum, when you open the drum, the first thing you should see is the sterilized napkin. So that after hand wash, you open the drum, use the sterilized napkin, uh, wipe your hands, then take the, someone will give you the sterilium, then you wear the gloves, then you put the trolley cover. This system has to be there. 
after a proper instrumentation see to it that you have a good suction then anesthesia is a very important thing because uh, keeping the procedure as less painful is uh, necessary for the uh, patient so what anesthesia you can use is use one ml solution on each side of the mucosal anesthesia usually i i advise not to use a nerve block for interradicular implant placement the reason is that if Uh, your implant touches the tooth the patient will feel some pain and it will help you in reguiding that particular uh, implant if the nerve block is given and the anesthesia is there to the tooth then what happens is that as you are entering and if the tooth is touched the patient will not feel it because it's under anesthesia and after the anesthesia wears off he will uh, feel that there is some pain then you give nerve block when you are doing implants in the region of uh, maxillary tuberosity or mandibular retromolar area or nowadays with the izc and the buckle shelf you can you need the uh, nerve block otherwise uh, a spray you know there are some uh, authors which suggest that just a 2 2% la lignocaine spray or a 15% lidocaine spray 2% lignocaine spray i have used but it's not very effective we give it before we give the infiltration so that even the needle prick is not felt by the patient or if the patient is uh, having allergies related to lignocaine uh, products then 20% benzocaine which is a mucopain which can be also used or you can use a surface jelly uh, you can use a combination of the spray and the surface jelly or you can use anesthetic strips there are some anesthetic strips you just glue it on the mucosa where you want it keep it there for 3 minutes remove it the anesthesia is there then marking where you want to uh, put the implant you know the way in wire bending i keep on telling my students there are three things very important number one you should be able to you should know where to bend number two you should be able to mark where to bend and number three you should be able to bend where you have marked so if these three things are followed you will be good in wire bending similarly in implant placement also if you mark properly the entry point and then do it properly and go exactly in the same manner implant failures will be less if you have a gentian violet pain pain then make a mark with a indelible ink or uh, use a gentian violet bud make indentations with a sharp probe by checking the adjacent evaluation you know i always say that suppose you want to put the implant between premolar and the molar then feel the distal uh, bulge of the premolar root feel the mesial bulge of the molar root mark it and then in between that mark another way so you get a, a three pronged mark and the middle prong is where your implant should go then check the soft tissue thickness soft tissue thickness slowly you come to know how much it is but uh, in the initial years i used to check the soft tissue thickness uh, with a endodontic instrument you know with a stopper i used to put an stopper at zero and push it and when the instrument used to go and hit the bone the stopper used to come back and then i used to the way you measure your root length similarly i used to measure the soft tissue thickness and based on that i used to decide how much should be the length of the implant because if the soft tissue thickness is higher then you require soft tissue collar of the implant to be more and you need at least 4 mm of the screw portion to be in the bone to give you sufficient uh, anchorage so remember around 4 mm of uh, entry of the screw in the hard tissue is mandatory to give sufficient support then if you are taking the uh, i mean if you are placing the implant in a movable mucosa then sometime you may require a stab incision and uh, if it is otherwise what happens is that if you don't take a stab incision and you start uh, insertion uh, without taking a stab uh, stab incision the soft tissue starts getting winded around your uh, threads and that leads to lot of problems and lacerations so uh, there are now some screws which can be very safely inserted in the movable mucosa they have changed the design of the threads of the implant in that way but if you really feel that there is too much of soft tissue you can take a small stab incision and uh, put the implant then what is most important in uh, insertion of tad is the purchase point if you are in attached gingiva sometime and if you are feeling that you are going to slip uh, the implant then you can use a round bird to make a purchase point uh, but apart from that if you have a very sharp and a pointed probe 
uh, with that also you can make a dent into the cortical plate so where your implant can go because otherwise the most common problem of failure while insertion is the implant rather than going into the bone going in the pocket between the periosteum and the uh, bone surface and that is where initially you feel that there is a good primary stability but later on when you apply pressure there is a movement of that implant which starts and that is the major problem so uh, when you are uh, doing this taking a proper purchase point either with a uh, drill or with sharp probe is important okay so these are the uh, different types of uh, 0.2 or 0.3 mm uh, smaller than your implant then loading the implant carefully in the driver because in our clinic twice we had a issue where the implant fell down on the floor when we were loading the implant so loading the implant by keeping your hands on the tray is very important always keep one implant extra because at that point of time if the implant falls down or something happens uh, taking another proper sterilized implant becomes a problem then implant insertion has to be done with a moderate driving force you may require a palm grip for that you know if you are doing general dentistry or if you have a wife who is a prosthodontist and you have a physio dispenser in your clinic nothing like it use that physio dispenser at a low torque it will excellent it will be one of the very excellent device without doing anything your implant will be in place very important is that you must have a smooth and a non jerky action when you are uh, threading the implant after you put one clockwise uh, movement when you are uh, recapitulating that time if you are shaking then the implant stability will be uh, affected and that is what happens uh, to those who are doing it initially and uh, these jerky actions can affect the stability of the implant uh, initially it was advised to use continuous irrigation but nowadays as you are doing it very slowly it doesn't generate so much of heat so this irrigation is not required but initially it was advised uh, it should be at around 30 to 40 degrees to the occlusal plane in maxilla and around 10 to 20, 20 degrees to the occlusal plane in the mandible so these are the various implant drivers so this is how your final position of the implant should look like this is how the final position of the implant should look like uh, I would like you all to go through this particular article by Yoseng Park uh, because this is again a Korean team in February 2010 uh, they have given a very nice article on how the proper mesodistal angles for micro implant placement can be assessed with three dimensional uh, CBCT and these are the uh, what they have said that even though our entry point is proper our final point of the tip of the implant will matter depending on the mesodistal angulation because not only the vertical angulation is important but the mesodistal angulation is also important so you can actually uh, have this uh, as a template in front of you if you have got a uh, sectional CBCT there so these are the things this is on the buccal side this is on the palatal side and uh, as I showed you on the 3D, this is on the CBCT also, you can evaluate how much bone is there. So if you take a sectional CBCT, you can very well see on the 3D evaluation also how it happens. Now uh, in the lower also, you can see this is how the placement should be. Now in lower uh, region, what is one of the most important problem which can happen is that because of this particular angulation, the uh, implant can go between the periosteum and the bone so be careful that it doesn't happen that way so this is again uh, the placement how it should be look at this now you should initially when you are placing you should start perpendicular to the cortical plate so as to avoid in the periosteum after two to three millimeter of insertion you can unscrew one turn and then change the direction as per the required uh, final position of the implant and you should when you should stop uh, inserting the implant is you should finish with the collar of the implant in close approximation of the soft tissue see uh, as I said one of the major reason for implant failure is the peri-implantitis and where the peri-implantitis can happen at the junction of the soft tissue and the implant and if your threads are there then there are chances of entrapment of the microbes is more high and the designs of the collar are designed in such a way the design of the collar of an implant is specifically thought for so that when that collar rests on the soft tissue it creates a little bit of seal which prevents peri-implantitis so you should uh, 
you know, stop the implant at a particular point or you should go till that particular point where the implant is in close approximation of the uh, soft tissue. So what we call it as you have to check the blanching effect because what happens when you are inserting the implant, the uh, threaded portion is going into the bone. So there will not be any blanching, but the collar portion is little bigger. So it will press on the soft tissue and around the implant you will have a little bit of blanching. When there, that blanching is seen, that means the abutment of your collar and the soft tissue is good. So you must keep on threading the implant till that point. Okay. And when the implant touches the root, the patient will complain of pain. If you have not given a nerve block, then what you can do is that you can unscrew few turns, then change the direction and then reinsert. And when you are doing uh, the last portion of the threading in, what is that called as the final terminal uh, insertion torque? It will give you an idea what is of the stability and the terminal uh, movement of the threading should be done in such a way that all the implants will have a head and an eyelet. Okay, that eyelet is basically to facilitate insertion of the ligature wire and that you should be able to see it. It should be kept mesodistally. If it is kept vertically, then insertion of the ligature wire sometimes become difficult. So you may have to add around 90 degree of additional movement to facilitate the insertion of the uh, ligature wire uh, into that particular eyelet. And after uh, the insertion is done with a tweezer, check the primary stability and then uh, give proper post operative instruction about the good oral hygiene, soft brushing around the implant, chlorhexidine gl gluconate mouthwash, there is something called as a passivating or sustentivity of chlorhexidine. So passivating effect is necessary. So always prescribe chlorhexidine uh, mouthwash so that adherence of the plaque will be less. Prescribe NSAIDs for uh, pain management and you can activate uh, immediately. There are various opinions. Initially we used to load two weeks after the insertion but the current study show that you can start loading. The initially they used to say that start loading with only 50 to 60 grams but that's not the case. You can start loading with uh, around uh, 200 to 250 grams also. Uh, and in the initial years we used to call the patient after two weeks for checkup and retraction loading, you know, final loading. So nowadays this particular procedure is not done. What is done is the final loading is done at the first go. Now while removal also you have to do uh, take some uh, care is first of all whatever is the uh, packet of your implant you preserve it in the patient's file. So that see we are using different uh, types of implant of different companies and unfortunately uh, we don't have the same type of head you know it's like the chargers Samsung will have their own uh, point Mac Mac will have their own point uh, you know what micro max will have their own different there there is a need in India to have a common sense that we must have a similar type of head of charger so anyone can use anyone's charger but that problem is again in implants also if I put company A implant, company B driver cannot go in that and I can't remove the implant and sometimes I mean people will agree with me once you put the implant after two years you forget which implant is there so that you try different three drivers and then realize oh this was the implant which was there. So whatever is the implant packet technically and medical legally also now with the medical license law you have to keep the implant car wrapper or whatever is the box as the uh, record of the patient so that which will have the batch number and all that thing and if you have that then you automatically know which implant you have used and you can use that particular driver because I know that there are sometimes some clinician face a situation that debonding is done but you can't remove the implant because you don't remember what implant was that and you can't uh, you can't get a hand to the driver which can remove that implant okay. Uh, if the head of the implant is covered by gingiva at the time of implant removal, do a little bit of spray incision and then remove. And if it is covered during the treatment, then expose and cover with a perio pack. So this was one of the first implants which we started using. This was, these were the local SK surgical implants. And this is how it used to look at after we remove it. it is, I mean, they all are quite comfortable. You can show these photos to the patient because the patient sometimes is more concerned that rather than insertion, when it is removed, how will the wound look like? So you have to show that this is it, how it will look on the first day and it will slowly start healing. So uh, then you started having uh, some uh, different types of implants. This is the anterior implant. And now coming to the actual biomechanics and the cases, 
this was the uh, concept which was shown by Dr. Chetan also. Now, uh, actually with the implants for an orthodontist, it has really become possible that we do get a place away from the teeth to move the teeth. So let's consider the teeth as the earth and we are the Archimedes. Okay. So what are the indications for implants? For anchorage conservation, that is reinforcement. It can be used for protraction of posteriors, intrusion of incisors, intrusion of posteriors, molar distalization, distal driving of the complete dental arches, correction of crossbite can be used in orthognathic surgery and can be used in skeletal correction. And some of these movements, take my word, were not possible till the advent of implant happened. Okay, uh, we used to do bite opening and other things, but because of some movement, there used to be some reactionary movement. So only suppose I have to do only intrusion, there has to be some extrusion happening somewhere so that then intrusion can happen. But with the help of implant, it is uh, possible now to do all these type of movement. Now when you are doing this type of invasive procedure, there will be some risk and complications with the orthodontic mini screws. So they are categorized as complications during insertion. What is the most common complication is the trauma to the periodontal ligament or the <coughs> dental root. So as I said that you can uh, not give the nerve block, check the patient's uh, perception to the touching of the uh, tooth and then redirect it. Even if you touch the root, I mean our department has a study uh, which says that even if there is an uh, uh, indentation onto the cementum, within 12 weeks there will be a complete healing which will occur. So you don't have to worry about it. Even if there is a little bit of abrasion of the cemental surface which happens, there is going to be a uh, uh, thing. Thank you, Sandeep. Then slippage of the mini screw, slippage can happen into the periosteum. If you are doing it uh, for the mandibular tooth, it can happen. The slippage can be in the facial spaces also. If you are doing uh, the marpe and other thing, if you are doing palatal implants, slippage into the nasal cavity, slippage into the maxillary sinus also can happen. So you have to be very careful when you are doing it. There can be an involvement of the nerve or there could be um, damage to the blood vessel. Then there could be uh, subcutaneous emphysema. Remember one thing, whenever you are doing any surgery in the oral cavity region, whether implant or, or oral surgery, I mean uh, disimpaction or anything, do not touch the three-way syringe. Because the most common thing an orthodontist loves in his hand is a three-way syringe. They'll pick up the three-way syringe and put the air and water. It's not required because this particular air can lead to a lot of emphysema. So avoid using air rotor and three-way syringes when you're doing any invasive procedure. Um, nasal and maxillary sinus perforation. There could be mini screw bending, fracture, and uh, you know torsional stress can lead to all these issues. So uh, for these, you have to plan the removal with trephinations and other things. Soft tissue complications. The most common, if you have seen for so many years, if you are practicing, the most common problem sometimes happens after insertion is after ulceration. And my experience is that if the patient is on antibiotic, if you have given antibiotic, the most common site for after ulceration is the prick of the local anesthesia injection. Around that you get this. So what we do is that uh, along with uh, the antibiotic if you are prescribing, what we do is that we uh, prescribe some multivitamins to take care of this aphthous ulceration because sometimes the patient says that it is hurting and it is hurting. You feel that the implant is hurting but when you see there is some different aphthous which is at a different area and what I have found is the site for that aphthous is where you have done the local infiltration. So then soft tissue coverage of the mini screw, the head and even the auxiliary. So in that case what you can do is that if you feel that you cannot keep the head of the implant away from the soft tissue, put some hooks, they are called as noni hooks, put in that eyelet and that extension of the hook can be outside. So even if your soft tissue covers that head, that extension of the hook can be used for retraction. Then soft tissue inflammation, infection and perimplantitis are very common, we will discuss how to do. Then complications under orthodontic uh, loading is uh, failure of the stationary uh, anchorage, there are, uh, Eric Lou has reported an article where he has shown 
uh, the implants moving because of orthodontic uh, forces and that is mainly because of the type of the bone mini screw migration then during removal mini screw fracture i mean uh, dr sandeep and dr sachin and dr varsha will remember that the uh, type of implant which we used to do in uh, initial years in our college when we are uh, done with the uh, in, uh, case and when we are doing the removal only the head used to come out and from collar the rest of the implant used to be inside and we found the reason is basically they are not using the type 5 titanium type 5 titanium contains lot of vanadium and that prevents the see these are the implants where we don't want osseo integration if it is not type 5 uh, uh, titanium then what happens is that this titanium leads to osseo integration and when you are removing the implant only the portion which is away from the uh, tissue only the head and the collar comes out the rest of the implant is osseo integrated so removing with trephination is also a very difficult thing so that dealer uh, i mean one of our uh, sandeeps one of the batchmate did a study about uh, the content of that implant and we found there's too much of titanium was there so we advised the dealer manufacturer to reduce the amount of titanium and add some vanadium and after that this particular incidences were uh, reduced then uh, as i said partial osho integration now uh, about the home care uh, what you need to do is that uh, as per the fda uh, evaluation you cannot give implants for any patient who is below 12 so all these should be given above 12 and they are contraindicated and heavy smokers and patients with bone metabolic disorders and optimal oral hygiene is very important use of chlorhexidine mouthwash should be done and what is the benefit the you know there is an anionic nature and the cationic nature the cationic nature of chlorhexidine leads for the sustainability so it has a passivating effect it doesn't let the plaque accumulate or adhere to the implant and it takes care uh, so it acts like a prolonged bactericidal and bacteriostatic effect but the problem is the staining so what should be done is that you tell the patient to do the um, oral rinse with chlorhexidine first after five minutes rinse and then do the brushing okay and the brushing should not be done over the implant after the mouthwash is used so for what we advise what i advise is that clean the area tell the patient to clean the area around the implant with your small praxa brush okay then rinse with chlorhexidine in the mouthwash after three minutes rinse with regular water and brush the teeth without touching the area in the implant region okay so uh, this as i said this sustainability stains the enamel so that leads to a lot of stains on the teeth so you know the clinician should strongly advise the patient the surface contact from the toothbrush can remove the chlorhexidine coating so if the patient is brushing after see if you do the mouthwash after brushing high chances of stains are there so if you do the tell the patient to do the mouthwash and followed by the uh, brushing tell them not to touch the area of the implant okay so uh, here the authors they, i will give you the reference the authors have advocated rinsing with chlorhexidine and waiting for 30 minutes which is not practically possible i tell the patient to wait for three to five minutes and then go in for a fluoridated brushing okay uh, sometimes the retraction modules the e chains and other things can impinge onto the alveolar mucosa from the implant so you can tell the patient with a small toothpick how to take that particular e chain away from the soft tissue so that embedding of that e chain into the soft tissue will not happen about the failure literature quotes 80 percent success rate and around 11 to 30 percent so roughly average 20 percent of failures is basically because of proximity of the roots with dental structures proximity of the implants with the roots of the dental structures bone density type of screw material design and geometry where do you place them whether they are self drilling or self tapping self drilling implants stay longer peri implant soft tissue how it is and force levels and stress distribution and uh, dr chetan has um, mentioned you have taken this in detail na chetan the sorry okay fine so i'll just quickly go so how uh, without implant you need to adjust and give a curvature into the wire but with implant you don't have a posterior thing and how the rotation can happen chetan will take this in detail so this is how the intrusion will take place and
how to use two implants and if you use implants both in upper lower how the retraction can happen how there will be deepening and how there will be posterior op open bite which can happen now coming to the case reports these case reports are actually it's me how i am evolved as a clinician after the introduction of tads in clinical practice so most important thing have all the records in place before you start with any project you know all the resources should be available okay if this happens then what do you do orange juice use orange juice have you seen delhi belly okay so let's start with cases where i have used tads in sagittal control the first case i will show with all the records uh, but later on i will show only selected records to uh, you know show more cases in less time i will take 5 minutes sandeep sir okay so this was a case where there was uh, anterior open bite proclination uh, bad lower 6x you can see there is lower uh, this pouting of the lips and uh, this is one of my first case uh, which i used with implants where i used implants for anterior retraction in the upper and in the lower for protraction of molars so after analyzing the case we decided to extract the upper premolars and the lower molars because lower molars were uh, very bad so it is an upper 44 and lower 66 extraction 1424 this is the occlusal view uh, this is the cephalogram you can make out uh, the amount of proclination this patient have here then uh, look at the uh, reason why we extracted the 6 there was a history of uh, rct done but there is a resorption and other issues here there is also again uh, resorption of the tooth surface which has happened both the third molars are good uh this third molar re requires assisted eruption upper 8 was extruded so we extracted that 8 so this is how we went ahead this is the implant which we placed i wanted a little bit of downward movement so we went ahead and gave a retraction pressure this was the x ray or rather the cbct when the implant retraction was going on see here you can see the implant is between 5 and 6 lower i had kept it in between in such a way that uh, 50% of the space can be utilized for retraction and 50% of the molar extraction space can be used for mesial movement of the uh, molars so this is how the seven coming ahead this is how the bone was so as i had the uh, uh, x ray i thought i will uh, share so this is how uh, when the molar extraction case is there how we do it uh, still there is little bit of molar tipping which happens which we corrected by molar uprighting spring so this is the correction uh, which is happening uh, this is the uh, molar uprighting spring which we use because even if you have used implant uh, the amount the the point of application of force is not close to the cr and because of that mesial movement will happen but the roots will stay there so that root uprighting will be required so this is the uh, uh, pre activated uh, molar uprighting spring this is how it should be uh, in the intraoral uh, region after activation this is for both sides this is for the left side the previous one was for the right side this is for the right and left and after the uprighting was done you can make this is the time where we uh, removed the uh, uh, implant and then went ahead with the further closure of the spaces this is how the patient is now here you can make out the uh, incisors are getting retracted they are coming in good class 1 canines are coming in class 1 but the molars here are going to be in a class 2 relationship because i have a lower molar extraction and this is how the patient is at the end of the treatment this is uh, left side is before right side is after you can make out here there is a good molar uprighting which has happened class 1 molar and a class 1 incisor has achieved here this particular molar was showing lot of mesial tipping we uprighted that with a molar uprighting spring uh, this is the progress occlusal photographs you can see that there is a retraction which has happened uh, this is the protraction of that this is the 6 which was extracted 4 7 came in here remember 4 8 was impacted we waited then this is the uh, 7 which is again coming ahead so this is uh, after the mesialization this is 7 this is 8 and this is how the patient is at the end of the treatment so this is the uh, post treatment extraoral photographs and post treatment intraoral photographs this is the comparison of intraoral before and after treatment this is the comparison extra oral you can see there is lot of improvement in the profile and the competency and what uh, 
uh, here we can see is that uh, see there is a <coughs> proclination and the inclination of the uh, alveolar process is also uh, high so probably uh, and there is a concept that is called as that when you retract with implants there is something called as an alveolar bending effect and this particular alveolar bending effect comes with uh, uh, movement and the recently if you have been to Bhuneshwar, Dr. KJ Lee also showed that when you retract the teeth come out of bone and they are covered by periosteum and if you stabilize the teeth there this particular periosteum deposits fresh bone and after around six months you can see bone getting developed around those teeth so when you are retracting and if the pressure is slow and you can do it within the confines of periosteum even if the tooth comes it looks as if it is coming out of the bone still remodeling will take place and here you can see there is a frank uh, uh, remodeling uh, and the alveolar bending which has happened and probably soon we will have an article on uh, alveolar bending before and after retraction is it going to come or not okay so these are the uh, uh, superimpositions these are the rickets five point superimposition this is the uh, view which you can see here this tooth is extracted look at the amount of uh, root paralleling the whole mesial movement was possible because of the implants it is possible with the loops also but with implants it is easier and faster uh, it doesn't look like as if a 6 is extracted here what you see distal to 5 is 7 and 8 on either side these are the two root canal treated teeth with the crown are extracted so this was the tad in combination of sagittal movement upper retraction lower protraction so can we have a combination of this in sagittal movement as well as in vertical control so this was a patient with proclination you can see there is a gummy smile which is there you can see here the patient has quite a bit of gummy smile and uh, extractions done so this is how the patient is this is the uh, intrusion which we are doing there is a retraction and an intrusion pressure with the posterior implant as I told you that it's an extraction case so I'll be using one implant in the anterior region uh, okay a disclaimer people feel that as I'm attached to a college the cases which I show are treated in the college or an institute all these cases are treated in my private clinic okay so it's not that if you are attached to an institute then only you do these type of cases you can do these type of cases even in your private solo clinic okay and I practice exclusive orthodontics I don't have any oral surgeon coming I don't have any periodontist coming so this is possible if you decide I'm going to do a good work now here about the intrusion in the posterior region as I'm intruding in the posterior region Dr. Chetan mentioned that if the intrusion or any pressure is not in the line of center of resistance there's going to be some rotational effect or the moment which is going to happen so as I'm intruding on the buccal side there is a chance that there's going to be a buccal flare which is going to happen to prevent that you will either require a low-lying TPA or you require one palatal implant so in this particular case we have given a low-lying TPA I give this particular low-lying TPA in a little modified way I put these helices so if at all the buccal flare is not amenable to the low-lying TPA in spite of giving the low-lying TPA still you have a buccal flare and the hanging of the palatal cusp down you can just
first molar that is 16 was bad it was badly carious uh, there was a root canal related issues this one uh, 26 was already extracted okay and 46 had a problem so we dis and 46 we'll utilize the space of 26 but that particular space the uh, 27 has nasally migrated okay so we had to distalize at the same time here we are going to take uh, the so we extracted uh, uh, 16 and 46 and we extracted 34 and we decided to use the space which was created by an old history of extraction of 226 okay the patient was any measles moment of this 7 that's the reason i decided to use a izc so this is the izc in one year and one year an anterior implant here for intrusion so this is how the progress you can see the uh, spaces are completely closed Uh, this is the space utilization for the molar with the hygiene and other things see the uh, cephalogram here you can make out there is a correction with a look at the amount of destruction i mean i am amazed at this girl i don't know my restorative dentist will have merry work to go so this is how the patient is at rest before treatment and after treatment you can make out there is a good competency so this is what they call it as the orthognathic like orthodontics so this is smiling look at the correction here look at this particular correction and look here okay and very important thing we have not affected the airway much look at the airway here and look at the airway here even though we have distalized the dentition we have not created much of the airway issues so uh, here uh, these are the cases where we have used the izc so this is basically for the sagittal and the vertical correction now class 3 uh, cases we can utilize so here you can see there is a full cusp class 3 and uh, there is a little bit of anterior open bite uh, and this is the class 3 tendency the patient had so we extracted uh, the uh, third molars and there was a para third molar which was there which is uh, which, which we extracted and this is how the retraction is happening see here you can see here the buccal shelf implants are in place the buccal shelf implants are little problematic to put in indian patients because the concept of buccal shelf implants started with mainly the east asian patients where they have lot of buccal shelf available so uh, before you decide to go in for buccal shelf implant please take a cbct of that particular area and try to find out whether bu sufficient buccal space availability is there or not otherwise you have to do a insertion of the implant uh, in the shelf area but rather than a regular vertical buccal shelf implant uh, you have to go in a more of a retromolar angulated implant so in that case you again go very close to the inferior alveolar nerve so this you have to balance it with the existing biology of the uh, patient so this is how the retraction uh, happened this is the change in the profile this is how you can see the molars are slowly getting uh, corrected in class 1 and this is how the patient is at the end of the treatment you can make out here there is a good class 1 incisor class 1 canine and class 1 molar relationship and this is the comparison yeah here you can make out uh, this is the uh, class 3 tendency of the mandibular dentition you can see see again here we have corrected look at the airway we have not done any issues with the airway airway is still quite good because distalization of the lower dentition affects the lower airway so when you are planning that look at the airway and if that airway is lesser then uh, you have to rethink about the distalization of rc what happens is that uh, this i can tell you after practicing for almost 26 27 years uh, whenever new technique comes we really jump into that bandwagon and then later on realize that these are the issues which we are facing so it is always better to listen to the experiences of the few people who have burned their fingers and lost their hair okay so this is how the patient is before treatment 
and after treatment quite a bit nice settling of class 1 has come from a class 3 tendency so you can make out it's very nicely settled and this is the uh, post treatment I think the patient has forgotten to extract the upper third molars ok so this is the uh, so this was in the lower uh, the buckle shelf implant for distal driving of the lower arches management of class 3 so uh, rather than showing similar type of cases again and again I thought I will share different types of cases where I have used TADS for different things so TADS in transverse control so this particular patient is a 23 year old patient reported to me with uh, a complete unilateral cross bite the cross bite starting from this lateral incisor to the molar on that particular side so you can make out from the lateral incisor the cross bite starts from here and goes till there so this is uh, so this particular patient has a transverse issue it's not a functional shift it's a proper true unilateral skeletal cross bite so this particular patient technically requires an expansion patient's age is 23 so we can't do probably a RPE so the only option initially was to go for a surgically assisted rapid palatal expansion patient was not ready and that's the time I came across it this is how the patient was the patient also had a little bit of I came across this particular article by KJ Lee that classic first article on Marpe that is KJ Lee's AJO DO June 2010 this is the first written report of micro implant assisted rapid palatal expansion they have done it in an orthognathic case I will show you a similar case done by me uh, later on and this is what they had shown so these are the photographs from his article and what he has done he has used monocortical screws ok monocortical screws that means they are engaging only the palatine cortex and taken modified the pre-existing RP screw hyrex screw with special wires soldered to that and then because the MSC and other things started coming now ok that time it was not there so I used uh, these implants 1.8 mm thick and 10 mm long in which uh, there is a 6 mm of collar so it's a soft tissue in the palate the collar is uh, requirement are higher because the soft tissue is going to be more so then we took the impressions uh, along with the bands and this is the regular RP hyrex screw which is modified by our technician and we have marked the positions of the implant on the cast and he adapted the wire around it so this is for a closer look this is a regular hyrex see the wire soldered on the adjacent surface here ok then this is what we cemented I gave these bite blocks to disocclude the uh, occlusion and we secured the uh, encircling of the wires with the help of composite ok this is how the patient was then we started giving the turn and you can make out here the uh, midline diastema has started appearing which indicates that there is a expansion which is happening at the sutural level ok so this is how you can make out a little bit of asymmetry the patient had look at very closely uh, this side there is a mild deviation to the left side the cross bite is on the left side there was a mild deviation it was not a functional shift but there was a proper deviation slowly started getting corrected and remember any expansion in the maxilla will be having an extrusive effect this patient has a class 3 tendency this extrusion helped me in counter clock or rather clockwise rotation with the mandible and you can make out his her lower anterior facial height is also improved look at the lower anterior facial light here and look at the lower anterior facial light here the face looks little longer ok you can see the midline diastema appearing this is a midline diastema ok uh, where do you stop the expansion I stop the expansion when the palatal cusp starts touching the buccal cusp of the lower uh, molars palatal cusp of upper molars start touching the buccal cusp of lower molars so we took a CBCT we could see that there is a uh, expansion which is happening at the sutural level ok uh, but later on I realized that I should not have done this without taking a CBCT pretreatment so this uh, angularis classification of uh, sutures 
This is an AJODO November 2013 issue. Uh, Fernando Angulieri has given a classification of the uh, sutures based on the CBCT evaluation, whether it is a stage A, B, C, D or E. And accordingly, what has my experience is that at stage E, uh, even MARPE doesn't work. So you have to probably think of surgically assisted rapid palatal expansion uh, in cases where the classification is to the tune of E, where there is a complete fusion and obliteration of the suture has, has ha happened, uh, I have not been successful along with uh, whether it is MARPE or whether with MSC. Now, this is, the, please go through that, I am not going in the detail, okay. So this is stage D, stage E. So the previous ones are stage A, B, this is stage C, this is stage D and this is stage E. You can make out there is complete obliteration of the suture which happens, okay. So uh, this is something you should be little careful of. And this is now then uh, after that we removed the upper expander, we continued with this. There is a modified uh, uh, Zakrisen type of TPA which I use, if I have a photo I will show it to you, to maintain the expansion. This is the expansion maintained, this is mid treatment, this is mid treatment and this is post treatment. You can make out now there is a proper uh, closure which is happening here. See here, this is a proper closure which is happening here. Okay, so this is post treatment. So this is the extra radicular palatine use. Now uh, this is before treatment and this is after treatment. You can see the whole cross bite is properly corrected. You can see the expansion happening. Now which cases to use for MARPE and which case to go for MSE? MSE is maxillary skeletal expansion where the screws what you use are bicortical screws. They are longer they engage the palatine cortex as well as the nasal cortex. Uh, cases where there is a buccal tilt of the molars or upper posteriors to start with are the cases which should not be done even with MARPE. You should go in for a MSE which, which is a bone supported expander. The difference between MARPE and uh, this is that one is a bone and a tooth supported expansion okay where you use monocortical screws and there is something called as only bone supported expansion so cases where there is a buccal flare on the crown of upper posteriors it is always better to go in for uh, bone supported and when you are using a bone supported don't use monocortical screws so go for screws which take bicortical support okay so they will be taking support from your palatine cortex as well as your nasal cortex okay now uh, this particular patient similarly she had a history of previous orthodontic treatment done this is how the patient was when the patient came to me after uh, treatment happens to be uh, daughter of one of my very uh, senior friend very reputed dentist in Pune so we went ahead and did the same thing see the amount of expansion yeah, this is the design, this is the modified Zakrisen's type of TPA which we use after giving any sort of expansion. Suppose even in mixed dentition case also, if I do a RP, I will give this till my uh, posterior settling stage comes. At posterior settling stage, we cut the uh, wires mesial to the molar and we cut the TPA just before two months of debonding where we are giving the vertical settling elastic because if this is not done properly and the torque not adjusted, the TPA leads to a buckle flare. So be careful about it. So this is how it is in the patient's mouth. And this is how the patient is before mid-treatment, mid-treatment, started with fixed appliances, settled, and this is before and after. Now here you can make out the whole cross bite which is on the uh, right side is corrected. So this is how it was. And now this is how it is completely corrected. Okay, now, uh, this is a case where uh, there is a lot of cross bite related issues but I am not more much bothered. What I am more bothered is this. This is uh, the third molar is horse riding the second molar. Okay. So uh, we evaluated there was no ankylosis of the seven. So this is actually a piggyback. 
so we extracted so i tried upwriting that seven after extracting the third molar with various mechanics but somehow i was not getting sufficient biomechanical control because i need to push that tooth behind first and then upright so i used a this was the cantilevered spring which i used to use during those days but i used something called as a bracket head implant this particular implant has a bracket head so you can engage the wire directly and from there i used a wire a tma wire directly an uprighting spring which uprighted as well as it distalized the molar so i wanted to unlock the molar by the distal moment and upright it by center of rotation at the distal root tip so that the uprighting happens completely and you can make out its uprighting so see this is how the moment will be exerted on to the molar and this is how the moment will be exerted on the implant so what is the moment on the implant in which direction clockwise so whenever there is a force clockwise on the implant what happens it becomes more and more tight but only thing is that you can't use so you need a clockwise right side implant here and if it is on the other side and i have to this is the mirror image of the same case this is not a different case this is for you to understand the biomechanics what moment i require on the second molar clockwise so when i put a spring what moment will come on my implant and what anti clockwise moment will do it will start unscrewing so you need to put a anti clockwise left side implant these implants are available in the market what is the difference in all the implants when you are inserting you do clockwise movement this is the implant when you are putting it in you have to do un, uh, counter clockwise movement anti clockwise movement then only it will go in okay so please remember this is this is again where biomex sir was mentioning that it's not a dry subject it is required in day to day practice okay so this is what is the thing and you can make out it is uprighted then we went okay this is for comparison this is upright you can make out here it is uprighted here this is how we extracted and this is how it is uprighted with the implant okay this is for a closer look okay and this is how the patient is at the end of the treatment okay so for uprighting of the second molar it is not necessary always to go in the retromolar area because access is an issue so when you upright a molar by a retromolar support the type of pressure you are going to use is pull but if you can take a support in the anterior region what you need to do is that think of biomechanics and use a push mechanic to upright your molars okay now competitor so she keeps on falling and injures her incisors so this is before again she injured but you can see the posterior bite is correcting if this would have happened before i wouldn't have extracted upper premolars i would have extracted centrals and closed the space okay now here you can make out see the uprighting of the six has happened and this is how she is at the end of the treatment look at this look at the seven also is in now good occlusion here see the seven here and see the bite on this side do i have a comparison look at the amount of rolling yes see this is the comparison now the anteriors are crowned so they are not looking that well i think they require crown lengthening and better crowns i need to talk to dr pradeep shetty is he here no is gone look at the uh, correction of the bite here and look at the correction of the bite here you can see the flare has corrected look at the uh, buccal surface here see you, when you see from the occlusal side there is lot of buccal surface seen and here when you see it's not seen so that indicates that there is a uprighting which has happened okay and i think i'm showing you the last case where similar issues six was completely out okay and the seven was impacted here seven was impacted okay so what we did is that we gave the same thing i didn't wanted any uprighting the patient had lower incisors missing see there are deciduous incisors so i extracted upper 44 and lower aa and uh, we got this in and taking the support of these implants i gave an uprighting spring on the 7 can you see here there is an uprighting spring on the 7 here and this is how you can see this uprighting has hap slowly happening this is before uh, yeah 
and now you can make out it is corrected the bite is still deep i would have loved to correct it but look at the seven and look at the bite which is corrected on this side okay now you can use a unilateral tad to correct the midline see this particular patient uh, is having the midline issue so we gave a tad only on one side and corrected the midline when you are doing this be very careful this can lead to canting so keep a watch and accordingly adjust the height of your uh, hook to prevent any canting and this is how you can see the midline was on the left side of the patient it is getting corrected so this is another patient where upper right lateral incisor was missing okay so i wanted to completely distalize on the left hand side so on one side okay so we were retracting with the help of this uh, izc and we distalized the whole upper dentition on one side and you can make out now there is a uh, correction of the midline which has happened okay this is to correct the lower midline okay in prosthetics also you can see the tags here i don't know i think the battery is gone look at the extrusion here look at the extrusion you have a pointer just i need a pointer thank you so here look at the extrusion here look at the extrusion apart from the other issues the patient had six missing six missing this side six missing okay so what we did we are intruding here look at this the amount of intrusion happening so one is a palatal implant one is a buccal implant so it's a slingshot intrusion now see the amount of intrusion happened see the comparison here see only this much was the space available now we have a this much of space this is the occlusal surface of uh, five and this is the occlusal surface of five see the amount of intrusion same thing i'm not i just want to show you the last case yeah this is a case with anterior posterior vertical and transverse all deficiencies class 3 uh, transversely there was a problem so now if this particular patient had to undergo a surgically assisted expansion there you there will be cuts in the piriform fossa and other thing so the patient had to undergo two surgery twice first or i have to do a three piece osteotomy in the maxilla so it was getting little complicated so what we decided we decided go for marpe do the expansion okay you can see the expansion happening okay and then we carried out this is how the patient just before surgery so then from here doing it two jaw surgery maxillary downward movement advancement and mandibular setback both was easily possible look at the amount of discrepancy this patient required a 17 mm of correction okay uh, upper canines are occluding with the uh, molars upper canines are occluding with the look at the amount of discrepancy and this is immediately after surgery and this is how the patient is after surgery again this patient is a uh, foreign national i couldn't get hold of him after covid so this is how we finished so when i saw him last he was at this particular stage so from here we went ahead did the expansion strapped up the case pre surgical post surgical so this is anterior you can see the transverse getting corrected now this is with the help of marpe so i i told you dr kj lee's article shows a similar case they have corrected the transverse with marpe and then did the surgical correction so this is before pre surgical immediate post surgery and final so i would like to end uh, this is chetan knows this is my favorite uh, thing uh, dr robert kim way back in 2005 who was the uh, editor of journal of clinical orthodontics said the future of orthodontics will be uh, three dimensional imaging uh, which will replace the 2d cephalometry self ligating brackets micro implants for anchory control 2005 so probably the future will be the transparent appliances the aligners so again in aligner also there will be a search 
people will start every tom dick and harry will start using appliances then there will be a decline patient will burn the finger the doctors will burn the fingers then they will come to know that these are the cases which can be and should be done by aligners and these are the cases which might require a regular conventional orthodontics so this is how uh, things are going to happen so what is the conclusion 3d control of tooth movement is possible with the tads whatever you call it as tad bad sad whatever tads will be used in growth modulation as you know pmp is already used bone anchored maxillary protraction the technique which is given by yugo d clerk is used so class 2 corrections also will start happening soon with tads uh, we need to unlearn learn and relearn things and remember change is the only constant thing tads are here to stay they are are here so this is a slide which i had made in 2006 so tads are here to stay in tads are already stayed rest of the things have gone headgear is gone out for toss for anchorage control but for orthognathic or orthopedic control it is still there so what what an clinician should tell himself as you are growing in your practice you have to tell yourself i have to better be better than my yesterday's myself today when i see a case i should think that i should treat it best than what i treated my case yesterday yesterday's debonding i should find out at least five mistakes if i don't find out five mistakes i am uh, becoming dead as a clinician so remember no one can motivate you unless you motivate yourself sandeep sir varsha madam anil sir arun sir they are your uh, lanterns you have to motivate yourself so i would like to end with a very favorite example of mine you know breaking of an egg is a very excellent thing about external and internal motivation see when you break an egg with an external force what happens omelet and when the same breaking of egg happens from inside out there is a creation of life so break your egg from inside out make maximum utilization of these type of opportunities to learn keep on learning when i am sitting there listening to chetan sir or anyone at least i pick up one point i say oh my day is done so shoot for the moon even if you miss you will land among the stars a happy dreaming all the best for all the endeavors in your life looking forward to your active support in the activities of indian orthodontic society and uh, thank you very much sandeep sir and his team shigli sir and diva patel dental school actually this is a part of the program of orthodontic celebration week so even though we are late by 15 days wishing you all a happy orthodontics day and an excellent orthodontic year those who are students may their 20 cases get debonded during the exam <laughs> those who are practitioners may you get 25 new cases in diwali vacation okay thank you very much have a nice day anybody has any doubt any question Okay 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 okay
So thank you and uh, we come to the last lecture now. I know it's, it's, it's that part of the day where you don't want to hear any more theoretical stuff, right? So I'll try to make it more clinical and uh, again this will be slightly a mixture of TADS along with fixed functional appliances because Dr. Jayesh showed you some cases in which class 3 camouflage can be done using buckle shelf screws. So likewise can you do a different type of camouflage in class 2 using either fixed functional appliances or with TADS. How do you decide which one will suit you better? And that's more to do with the clinical uh, information here. So let's start with uh, the title itself says that challenging the limits of camouflage. And as Dr. Jayesh was mentioning in the 21st century, what you've seen is a new paradigm altogether, trying to convert many of the borderline surgical cases, which earlier we had to do with surgery, especially the gummy smiles and the vertical maxillary excesses. We always used to tell the patients that, sorry, we do not have an option using orthodontics alone. And this was pretty much straightforward across the world. But after the advent of TADS and those wonderful cases that the Koreans and the Japanese started showing, people started looking at the other option. So that was one. And likewise, there has been an upsurge in the usage of fixed functional appliances also for class 2 correction, even in young adult patients. So what is it that, how do you know which case might suit well? And is there a place for combi combining the class 2 correctors, that's the fixed functional appliances, along with TADS? I'll show you one case of that also. So that's where we start. So if you look at the 21st century, what is more important from the patient's point? Patient never asks you for a class 1 occlusion, isn't it? Has any patient come to you and said my A and B is 2 degrees correct or A and B is 4 correct it or my molar relation is end on on one side, please correct it? No, they want a beautiful smile. So more importance is given to the smile dynamics as well as what we refer to as the patient-centered care. From being a paternalistic approach wherein the doctor used to decide everything for the patient, now we take the patient's input, the parent's input and the present trend of what is considered as aesthetic in order to bring about our results. So that is where we are headed to. And in this endeavor, if you look at the overall approach of camouflage as such, just the camouflage, then the existing rules of camouflage may not work well. How many of you have heard of Steiner sticks? Steiner's limits of camouflage. How do you judge the camouflage, etc.? Because these rules were mainly dependent on the dental alterations only and possibility of skeletal anchorage or even facial modification was not known. And therefore, people, whatever was realistic in their realm, would do at that particular stage. So, for example, the Steiner sticks, all of you are aware of this, that you would compensate the upper and the lower incisors based on the angle A and B. But now, it is no longer the case. We know that we can distalize the entire dentition using TADS, or we can advance the mandible uh, to a certain extent, bring about dentoalveolar correction, which helps in the correction of malocclusion. Now, this particular case I take from Sarver's book. Uh, some of you might have heard or, or seen this particular uh, case. He has shown it in Graeber Vanastal also. So, this was a case in which uh, orthodontic extraction was done and all first premolars were extracted. And look at the aesthetic outcome of this. The nasolabial angle is totally opened up, the mandible is deficient, there is hardly any lip, uh, chin, throat angle, the throat length has reduced. Yeah, I think I had one. Thank you. Throat length has reduced and therefore, this case would not be acceptable in the present condition. You know what type of a problem this patient will end up with? Anybody? With the OSA airway obstruction that's likely to happen whereas what Dr. Sarva did was later on he did a bimaxillary advancement 
surgery to advance both the maxilla and the mandible in order to get the facial proportion set right. Now this was what the kind of camouflage which was done earlier reflected upon and what we need to understand and how do we correct it from there. That is what I am going to address. So I am going to talk to you about the capabilities. In fact, Dr. Jayesh has made my work simpler because he has already given you the capabilities of TADS. So we will look at it again in a nutshell, the capabilities of TADS as well as the fixed functional appliances. Where is it that TADS would score better in a class 2? Where is it that the fixed functionals would score better? And then reconcile as to what would be the ideal way. So therefore, reason out where the uh, one modality would work better than the other. That is what we are going to look at. So these options of camouflage are already known to you. Either do upper first premolars only, that is the typical trend for most of the skeletal uh, for the class 2 camouflage when you want to do. Later on people were doing more of upper fours and lower fives and what would this achieve? It would achieve mainly class 1 molar relationship but it would not try to get your uh, the skeletal relation corrected in any way. Likewise, extraction of AIDS and NMAS upper arch distalization that has become more popular now. I mean, uh, initially we were doing it with two tads, two interdental tads. That's, that's the method shown by KJ Lee. But after the bone screws came in, the IZCs became popular because you need not use two screws. Neither do you have to remove one and again shift the location. So you can distalize the entire upper arch. And that, that's something that is favorable to all of us. And of course, the usage of fixed functional appliances because there are selected indications in which the fixed functional appliances will do the job of distalization of the upper arch and advancement of the lower dentition and therefore those cases also should be known to you and how to handle them. So if you look at some of the literature again this is an interesting article it was uh, published by our own friends Madhurupadhyay and Sumit under the guidance of Dr. Ravinanda in the University of Connecticut. Now this was a relatively old study published in the Angle uh, 2012 that tried to compare the effectiveness of implants, micro implants and the uh, fixed functional appliances that they had used. And their findings were much uh, uh, so, so I mean whatever we would have expected is what they found. So what they realized or what they found through their study was mainly in the groups that they used that is the fixed functional appliances versus the TADS. With the TADS you could get good amount of distalization as well as intrusion of the upper molar and the, uh, sorry this is the fixed functional appliance and the nasolabial angle became more obtuse whereas lip protrusion was seen more with the other group and this was something that would be evident or expected anyway. So let me put up my view as a clinician as to what would be the highlights or the major benefits of TADS in a class 2 camouflage. You see a variety of class 2 camouflage, uh, class 2 cases, skeletal class 2. Most commonly which are the ones that you dread the most? The ones with high angle, be it class 2 or class 3. Anytime we see a high angle class 2 or a class 3 we are like this patient need not come to me. I mean I am happy without uh, treating this or that patient. But then if knowing that you have beautiful vertical control allowing the mandibular plane to close upward you would be tempted to use temporary anchorage devices in those cases. What I mean to say is when you have a comparison between high angle and low angle class 2 cases which would you prefer to use TADS on? Obviously it would be the high angle cases because you need good vertical control also. So that's what we would be looking. It would be useful in high angle of course and it would also give you absolute anchorage control in anterior retraction only. That is those cases, Dr. Jayesh was showing one case in which he wanted only dentoalveolar movement of the upper anteriors and some intrusion of the anteriors and posteriors. Now in those cases when you want dental correction definitely you can use think of using TADS. Again there, there is a big advantage but you should not overdo it and I will show you one case in which one of our friend tried to do something and it turned out to be aesthetic, aesthetically quite bad. But before that, since we missed out uh, covering this part of the biomechanics, let's brush up this one. Is that okay with all of you? I'll show you four scenarios in which 
we use the tabs in different ways in order to bring about the best correction. And I want you to answer which would be the type of mandibular plane in which you would want that particular type of tad. Uh, are you aware of this particular terminology? Lower medium pull, medium level tads, medium pull tads, just as we have the headgear, low pull or the high pull headgear. Similarly, based on uh, Dr. Kyung's recommendation, we have the low medium or high pull tad vector. So basically we are looking at the center of resistance, whether we are lower at the level or higher up is what, what would be called as a low, medium or a high pull tad. Can we have the lights dimmed a little so that you can see this animation better? Couple of lights if you can switch them off. not too much of a difference. Anyway, I think you will be able to understand. We are showing the anterior dentition here and the posterior is connected. There is a first premolar extraction there. Typically, you have a wire which is connected and having a retraction hook for a tie back, let us say. Now, you want to get good amount of intrusion, retraction and absolute anchorage control. So, you place a tad in this region. Now, if you place a tad in the low pull uh, area, what is going to happen is this would be the line of force. Remember always in biomechanics, the first thing you have to understand or try to see is what is the line of force, the force vector. Then related to the center of resistance. So, where is the center of resistance here? It is somewhere between the root of the second premolar and the molar. But the vertical level is lower than that of your uh, center of resistance. So, what would be the, if we have a force vector here, okay, going in this direction, what kind of a moment is it going to generate? It is going to generate a clockwise moment. And this clockwise moment will cause a relative extrusion here and a intrusion in the posterior segment. In fact, in the first few years of TAD usage, Everybody was showing clinical reports, clinical case reports. Dr. Jayesh mentioned about uh, Dr. Ryuzo Kanomi, Creek Moore, etc. All of them were showing single cases or two cases. But in 2000, I think early 2000, around 2005 or 6, there was one study which tried to evaluate 20 cases which were treated consecutively. Do you know what the findings were? They said unexpectedly we are ending up with a posterior open bite in majority of the cases and these were all bimax cases which were treated with uh, tabs. What was the reason for it? Biomechanics. If you look at it, the entire uh, occlusal plane was tipping and they were using tabs in both upper as well as lower arches. So, what is happening here? You are getting a clockwise uh, rotational moment which in turn will cause a bit of steepening of the occlusal plane. Now, this is an exaggeration of course, this is not going to happen in your clinical practice, but just keep this as a reference for all of you to understand. So, if this, if you remember the morning lecture, I mentioned that in one couple system, you try to have an intrusive force, the equilibrium will, will generate an extrusive force. Here, luckily for us, be it tads or be it headgear, the entire thing is absorbed by the skeleton, by the bone. And therefore, you do not get to see the reactionary forces, the typical way in which you would see in a equilibrium situation when you use dental uh, or teeth as the supporting uh, areas, I mean for anchorage basically. Here you are using absolute anchorage and therefore, you can get away with that. So, this is what you are going to get. Now, let me show you, start showing you a case, couple of cases in which you can apply these mechanics and I want you to tell me what kind of force vector uh, of TADS we should be using. So, typical case, what do you see here? Unfortunately, because the, the screen is becoming too bright, you cannot see it very clearly, but can you see the gumminess here? And you can see that patient has protrusive lips, also a bit of deficiency in the chin, a high mandibular plane uh, kind of patient. So, what kind of a, when you see the overall smile, lot of gumminess. So, what kind of a retraction would you want in this particular case? Low pull tads, both upper and lower preferably, so that you will get the better result. 
you can use an izc also but then i always prefer to keep things simple because incidental tax it's very very easy to place and get away with izc is a, need a little more of orientation and you need to uh, work on it for a, for some time so this was how the patient was typical high mandibular plane along with bidental protrusion so what did we do we used two tads in the upper and the lower on either side low pull vector typical uh, mechanics and though we are using it mainly for retraction see the amount of facial change that you are going to obtain after the correction so you are using low pull vector which goes beneath the center of resistance on both sides so you would expect some mandibular rotation to occur and this is what uh, just a recap again trying to bring about the posterior intrusion and holding the anteriors so what do you achieve in the end you achieve the correction of your anterior open bite and at the same time see the overall change in the facial appearance see the reduction in the gumminess and this is a uh, patient treated by one of our students earlier so you can see the overall change there from there to there and there to there can you make out the drastic difference and this is without using any hero uh, heroic type of mechanics just simple two tabs in the anterior in the posteriors on either side so uh, try to make things simpler work for you this is again at the end of treatment and the overall superimposition okay now what about low angle cases can you use the same mechanics as i mentioned it may be detrimental and therefore in selected cases in which you want to bring about changes you have to use one of the two we have already discussed this invert the hook or use a higher power arm kind of a hook in order to achieve the same result now have a look at this patient what kind of a mandibular plane does she present with average to a low mandibular plane angle and she still has maxillary protrusion uh, increase in the uh, gumminess to some extent and the severe protrusion otherwise a classic sorry otherwise a classic uh, class 2 malocclusion class 2 dental which can be camouflaged with upper first premolar extraction only now in order to get the best result and also to intrude the incisors we use the tads for additional support along with upper first premolar extractions and this is what i was mentioning invert the hook distal to the canine keep the uh, implant mini implant slightly higher if possible as higher as possible so that you get that proper oblique vector which goes very close to the center of resistance doesn't cause any amount of mandibular plane uh, alteration as such and that will give you good result and this is what uh, she finished with when this patient didn't have a very good uh, uh, periodontal sub, uh, this thing maintenance but you can see that overall from the initial part she has got a much improved smile though she had a hint of uh, mandibular deficiency also so we had suggested go for an augmentation genioplasty alone in order to help but let me show you one case in which if we do the wrong type of treatment in in a selected class 2 what happens so this is i borrowed it from one of my friend who had shown it wanted to show it for the amort but we said that may not be the best case what do you see here in this particular case a deep mentolabial sulcus an obtuse nasolabial angle and the patient i do not have the intraoral pictures but she had a class 2 divan malocclusion now in this situation would you opt for tad supported upper first premolar extractions or you would think of something else how many of you would think of upper first premolar extraction just raise your hands anybody what is it that prevents you from thinking of that nasolabial angle one second deep mentolabial sulcus and the prominent nose also look at the nose prominence she has got a nose quite a good nose prominence now in this patient unfortunately due to a lack of the orientation with the tads this particular patient was treated with tads and upper first premolar extraction and this is how they 
manage to get the patient and what you can see is what do you see here the nasolabial angle has started to open up more and the mandibular deficiency has stayed where it is so i asked this participant not to show this case for the amorth exam simply because you are going against the principles of aesthetics that should have been applied in treatment planning right so just because you have a tad don't try to use it in every class to camouflage think of what might be the right choice as dr jayesh was mentioning any new modality which, which comes in we start jumping and using it in fact it's gone to a point i remember wherein even for a single tooth rotation they were using one tad on the buccal and one tad on the lingual on the palatal side and applying a e chain i mean we are orthodontists for heaven's sake we know how to apply a, a force couple and bring about a rotation why do you need a tad for a single tooth correction isn't it so don't do an overkill think of what would be the right diagnosis and the treatment plan in such situations so this was uh, one one particular part of it now let's see what is the strength or capability of a fixed functional appliance all of you would agree that it would be useful in increasing the face height provided you advance the mandible and this would be most appropriate in younger individuals not in adults but in young individuals in whom as you extrude the posteriors you are also going to get a compensatory lengthening in the ramus and the condyle are you all with me do you follow that okay so that is one big advantage where the fixed functional appliances would work it also helps in the reduction of the mentolabial sulcus even in young adult patients i'll show you a couple of cases of that and very useful for dislizing the upper dentition and retracting the upper incisors in class 2 camouflage cases if you are not going to do upper premolar extraction as dr jay showed if you want to do upper eight extraction and retract or you have spacing in the upper anteriors to begin with you can use a fixed functional and retract beautifully i'll show you a couple of cases young adult patients and that will make it strikingly uh, useful to you so i'll show you a young patient first typical class 2 div one in whom you can use a fixed functional appliance the first uh, in this particular patient we started intruding the canines unlocking the upper arch uh, the malocclusion and the transverse correction becomes very important then used a fixed functional appliance important thing with the fixed functional appliance is that you need to leave it for a sufficiently long period of time whichever class to corrector you use be it an advancing be it a forces be it a power scope don't be in a hurry to discontinue the appliance because that's where the biological part comes in you need to get good amount of remodeling in the condylar region and therefore and a, a simple tip for all of you is a minimum of 6 to 8 months is the required for cases with average overjet that's around 8 mm of overjet nothing less than 6 months and this is how the patient completed and you can see a lot of change especially in the upper dentition can you see in the upper dentition which was quite protrusive and there will be a comparison there which was quite protrusive and the mentolabial sulcus which was quite uh, uh, deep everything gets corrected can you see the deep mentolabial sulcus the upper incisors which were protrusive and this headgear like effect is available to you with all the fixed functional appliances the only consideration is how well do you apply your biomechanics while using a fixed functional what is the side effect of the fixed functional appliance which is generally not wanted lower incisor proclination and the other one is upper incisor retraction also excess retroclination so you have to make amends to prevent that from happening so what i do is i make a biomechanical uh, alteration in the force vector simply by that omega loop which you saw some time ago and that helps in bringing the force vector close to the center of resistance so this is how the patient was look at the soft tissues the deep facial convexity angle of facial convexity and the other one in which it reduces now you can also do combination of extractions along with fixed functional appliances i'll quickly show you one case in which we could have done a tad also but this was pretty uh, 
early when it wherein we used to use a lot of utility arches so i'll i'll, I'll just show you one case who has a typical bucks bunny appearance some of you may have seen if if you have heard me lecture on fixed functionals this particular case in which oops what happened who had an overjet of around 18 millimeters and in whom we had to do extractions of premolars intrude and retract in hindsight i would think of using a tad in the upper arch alone to minimize my effort but we used the utility arch in him and corrected but this is the initial phase of treatment he used to live in a residential school so never good with his hygiene this is midway into treatment after the correction and in fact he used to miss his appointments also so what happened was one fine day when he came back after about 3 or 4 months uh, past his appointment i could see that the upper incisors had severely retroclined and you had a negative overjet and he had started going into anterior cross pit so that's the point where in which discontinued added a bit of torque in the upper i don't have the photographs we use these uh, box auxiliaries for adding torque only on the two central incisors nowadays you have ready made springs they are called as warren springs some of you might have heard of it they are available for different dimensions of arch wire you just slip it on to the arch wire and make it at 90 degrees to the tooth it can generate either labial root torque or lingual root torque so that's what we did in this particular case this is towards the finishing stage and this is how we could finish the same boy and look at the overall duration this was just a little over 2 years i didn't know, need to do anything extra and in fact part of his upper incisor retraction was facilitated by the fixed functional appliance itself we didn't have to do anything differently so this is how we could finish this is the end result and comparison from there to there in just about 2 years so you can see the overall change quite a drastic change so this is definitely possible with using the fixed functional appliances and nowadays there has been this trend in fact in the uh, pune conference last month i spoke on a long term follow up of young class 2 uh, patients who in whom we had used the fixed functional appliances and i have had a follow up of about 7 years in in whom uh, some cases did relapse a bit but we are trying to understand through a cbct what is what is it that changed and why did they relapse and those successful cases what was it that made them successful so in maybe a year or so i should have more data on the way to handle young uh, adults with class 2s using a fixed functional appliance also so the indication for the fixed functional appliances would be those cases in whom camouflage by extraction is unsuitable like the case that i showed earlier the, the case in whom upper first premolars were extracted and tads were used borderline surgical cases in which in whom patients are not very concerned about the chin appearance you will come across some patients who are very concerned about facial aesthetics and then you will see many patients who say that i am okay with the chin just give me a good smile provided the aesthetic outcome is not going to worsen you can think of using fixed functional appliances in those cases also and wherever you need minor dental correction such as lower midline or lower molar protraction the fixed functional appliance itself will act as an anchorage booster for you just remember this if you want to use the fixed functional appliance for allowing lower molar protraction how will that happen because the fixed functional is anchored onto the lower dentition more towards the anterior region that entire anterior region is becoming a, a rock solid block and posteriors can be protracted sequentially using this particular mechanism so think of it in in that sense also in certain camouflage cases so i'll skip this this is the paradigm shift in which uh, nowadays we look at using the fixed functional cases even in young adults as well as moderate skeletal class 2s in whom we are not going to do the uh, 
surgical correction and in whom tabs are not really useful so we are looking at those patients in whom the cvm stage is already 4 or 5 so this is uh, a new ca category i would say but then since 2000 you can see some of these articles being published there is a series of articles in seminars in orthodontics also you can go through that this is from uh, roof and panchers the one who introduced reintroduced the uh, herbs the plants they have written several articles in 2008 10 recently in 2018 there has been a systematic review of uh, these appliances etc so you can go through those so typically another case from my clinic i'm just showing the extraoral change but this particular patient didn't want any change in the mandible in the chin prominence as such so he was treat he was an engineering staff and he was treated with a fixed functional appliance for his dental class 2 camouflage another case who was treated with a class 2 camouflage she refused surgery point blank she said i do not want anything other than or fixed braces you can do whatever you want but please do not uh, do any surgery in me so again in this patient the uh, treatment planning line of treatment was mainly to intrude the upper anteriors intrude and retract and allow the mandibular plane uh, or the mandible uh, and the dentition mainly to move forward so we used a fixed functional uh, appliance in her case and look at the overall change this is after the correction was done if you see the overall change it's it's hard to believe that we could manage her uh, in a non extraction fashion we had to do a bit of interproximal reduction in the lower incisor region to minimize the proclination but otherwise it was more of a dentoalveolar change with a good overall outcome in the facial form now this is a case in whom doing an upper first premolar extraction would have been detrimental because there were lot of spacing to begin with and this is a tip for all of you whenever you see severely proclined teeth with spacing start off non extraction don't jump into extraction uh, line of treatment because you find that your space discrepancy is let's say 14 mm 16 mm based on your lateral cephalogram sometimes it is misleading because as happened in in this particular case just with intrusion and retraction and closure of that space along with some mandibular dentitional advancement the entire facial drape changed are you able to see the overall change here in this and the this particular picture can you see i think a part of it is getting cut because of the slide but look at the overall change there to an improvement here not that we did anything uh, dramatic other than use a correct biomechanics intrusion retraction using a utility or in this case it was a three piece and the fixed functional appliance which was used at the right time so look at the change there so you will get a lot of patients like this in whom it can be used but then the cases in which you have to avoid using fixed functional cases definitely high angle cases also those cases in whom there is severe proclination of lower incisors in those cases don't jump into using a fixed functional appliance without retracting the lower anteriors first the bottom or, or the thumb rule is if the incisors are proclined beyond 100 or 102 degrees first try to upright them with whatever means it could be with ipr if it's my minimal or you could do a lower incisor extraction if there is a bolton discrepancy you have to choose between your case and then decide what would be the best line of treatment and uh, recently we did one study uh, one of our postgraduate student had done this uh, analysis and i'll just help uh, present the nut, uh, the summary of it in order to uh, uh, understand it better so what we did was we took andrews keys to facial harmony also all of you are aware of that right all the pieces is here so we try to evaluate based on the true vertical from the glabella which is one of the component from the andrews key and we also check the profile angle which was given by merrifield and we also looked at the total throat length as well as the lip chin throat angle and we are coming out with the analysis or or the rather the uh, best way of analysis between a tad and a fixed functional based on this approach it is still being done preliminary uh, a pilot study was done and i can uh, 
uh, tell you what the results were. So basically what you are looking at is, unfortunately this is not clearly seen, but you are looking at the profile angle. There is a line drawn from the uh, nose tip and there is a line which connects the nose tip to the chin just as you would use in the E line and this you call it record as the angle of convexity and the previous one that was shown here or the previous one I don't know why it's not shown yeah in this again you have the uh, true vertical which is drawn from the glabella and you also have the nasofrontal angle and the distance between the uh, upper lip that is the filtral area and the, uh, the subnasale to that of the chin the, using the convexity. So there are two or three indicators which we are trying to discern which will help us to tell which cases would favorably fit into a fixed functional uh, case even in young adulthood not just in youngsters but uh, adolescents but also in young adults so that's that's something that's likely to happen now there might also be a situation wherein you need a tad for vertical control and you still need to advance the mandible isn't it that's also possible any infinite number of variations can exist when you look at patients so i'll show you one particular case in which we tried to do both these together so this was a case in whom there was incisor show which needed the correction and if you look at the profile she also had a mandibular deficiency she also had lip protrusion uh, along with a short upper lip so overall she needed a good amount of correction by maxillary protrusion as well in whom we had to convert her into a extraction do her extraction uh, for the sake of retraction use implants for supporting the ver vertical and that is what you see here though it's not very clear try to control and since she was not a low angle case we didn't invert the hook we are using that and along with that used a fixed functional appliance for getting the mandibular dentition advanced mind you here it was not with the intent of a skeletal correction and this has been reported just as Dr. Jayesh was mentioning about the uh, the overall alveolar bone bending that happens when you use any of these uh, tads or, or the bone screws for class 3 correction we have also seen the same for class 2 correction so the entire symphysis tends to bend forward without just the dentition tipping but also the symphysial bending so that's something that we were trying to work out and this is one example are you all able to see the box auxiliary here so sometimes when you are using the implants along with the fixed functional you may tend to lose torque so instead of doing anything very different all that you can do is add a box to auxiliary like this for lingual root torque on the central incisors and this is for the uh, advancement also mandibular advancement and this is the overall change that we could bring about I mean looking at the nasolabial angle maintaining it at the same time getting the final correction was something that was very much essential so her lip protrusion has reduced she has got a good balanced profile and if you look at the overall chin prominence though we couldn't it's it's difficult to grow the chin beyond the age of 14 or 15 but at least the uh, frontal and the three quarter view there was a lot of improvement and again in in such cases we recommend usually that they go for a either a vertical reduction or an augmentation genioplasty depending on what kind of uh, facial form they have so ultimately what you have to consider is these points in patients with receding chin and low mandibular plane think of a fixed functional appliance and not a tad because you are worried about getting the mandible forward and getting the mentolabial sulcus altered very important to evaluate frontal dimension if the lower anterior face height is reduced and the patient has a deep mentolabial sulcus then necessarily think of using a, F, a fixed functional appliance so this is one rule that I follow in my practice you people can also try to adhere to this do a few cases you will understand how well this works 
Sometimes you may have to augment with a utility arch or a single tad on either side, but that's depending on individual patients. Whereas when you have to look at the other extreme, and that is when maxillary ex uh, prognathism is evident, think of miniscrew supported extraction therapy. How many of you actually palpate in the pre-maxillary area when the patient comes to you? Do all of you follow that? Just don't look at the patient from the side, but come and sit from the front, look at the patient, talk to the patient, just palpate and see in this area. You would see that beneath the roots, above the roots rather, there is a hint of alveolar prognathism uh, and there is a basal prognathism. So which one amongst those is happening in your patient? You need to look at it, not from the cephalometry alone, but clinically also. And remember that alveolar prognathism can be very well handled with orthodontics alone. No need of thinking of any surgery as such. So miniscrew supported extraction therapy would help. And if the mandibular plane, that's the length, and the throat length appears normal, obviously think of the TAD supported uh, treatment. High angle cases, even with the mandible looking a little recessive, you can still use the TADs because you know mandibular plane is going to close upwards and your chin prominence is going to improve. Dental class 2 with a soft tissue class 1, best treated with temporary anchorage devices. No doubt about that, isn't it? It's a straightforward uh, situation for you to handle. And patients with high mandibular plane angle but chin deficiency, you can think of a combination. Combination of TADs along with fixed functional appliances because vertical control is good with TADs, mandibular advancement potential is there with your fixed functional, try to go for a combination therapy. So these are some of the recommendations I thought I should share with you for today. And uh, remember, just as Dr. Jayesh was mentioning, that impossible is nothing. And this, there's a small video actually, but again it won't play in, in the full screen mode. It is about a person who is visually handicapped, but he just feels the textures and he can draw beautiful uh, paintings. And it's amazing to see how, what, what all he can achieve just by his imagination. What I mean to say is, all of you young budding orthodontists, it's up to you to explore. I mean, if you look at the East Asians, the reason why they came forward so well is not just because they are good clinicians, but they were also able to apply good research format, uh, formats into their education. So all of you, especially those who are coming from colleges in which there are very good staff to support you, there is nothing to stop you from becoming known on the global path platform. It's, it's about time that India is known as one of the four centers for orthodontic treatment also. We have such a big workforce, but it's just that we are not showcasing it enough to be known or recognized across the world. So on that note, wishing all of you a very successful career and best wishes in your postgraduate days. Hoping to interact with you again sometime in the future across several platforms. Thank you to all the organizing team for organizing this show and thanks to the audience for staying up so late till we finish the lectures. Thank you very much.